Hello, dear friends, it's Drake again. This story takes us to yet another country where a horrifying crime unfolds. Welcome to the vast and vibrant Brazil, with a population of just over 200 million people. This country amazes with its scale by all standards, making it one of the most diverse places on Earth. Now, our attention shifts to the metropolis of Sao Paulo. Currently the most densely populated city in Brazil, it serves as the economic heart of the country with numerous cultural institutions. Every year, over $200 billion pass through the city, and more than 4,500 families in Sao Paulo are classified as millionaires. This brings us to the von Richthofen family, extremely wealthy and living in the suburbs of Sao Paulo. Their small family mansion located south of the city in the neighborhood of Brooklyn is valued at 3 million Brazilian dollars. Along with numerous living rooms and bedrooms, the residence even boasts a pool, an office, and an extensive library. The entrance to the mansion consists of massive gates and the perimeter is protected from the outside world by a high brick fence with decorative masonry and exotic plants. The founders of this residence were the von Richthofen family, led by the father, Manfred, a talented German engineer and the director of a major company managing highways and roads leading to Sao Paulo. His wife, Mauricia, was a Brazilian by origin and worked as a local psychiatrist. The couple met when Manfred was studying civil engineering at the University of Sao Paulo, and as they say, it was love at first sight. Marisha's outgoing and friendly demeanor complemented Manfred's quiet and gentle nature. Eventually, they got married and started thinking about having children. In 1983, the couple welcomed their first child, a daughter named Susan, and four years later, her younger brother Andreas was born. The two children grew up in an affluent family, attending the most elite private schools in the city, and as a result, they were highly educated. Speaking of Susan, she could be described as a quiet young girl who often kept to herself due to her shyness. She wasn't a leader among the children, but Susan had a few friends. She was also an obedient daughter to her parents and got along well with her brother. As she grew older, Susan learned three languages, and after graduating from a German high school, she continued studying law at the University of Sao Paulo. If Susan succeeded in studying law, she would have been a more law-abiding citizen. Despite her aspirations for a successful and professional future, Susan didn't really need to worry about money, as her parents were very wealthy. The von Richthofen family's fortune amounted to about $17 million. According to unverified data, Susan's father had about 10 million euros in an account in a Swiss bank, an account that was fortunately planned to be passed on to her once she completed her education. Having had a carefree childhood, excellent education, and 10 million euros in the bank, Susan could only wait and be a good daughter and person. As the summer of 2002 approached, the dynamics between Susan and her parents began to change. Susan, now 18, started to think more about love than finances. In 1999, the family visited an aircraft model exhibition, sparking Andreas' interest in modeling. While at the exhibition, he met and struck up a conversation with a guy named Daniel Kravenhos. At the time, Daniel was 19 and skilled in model building. With growing passion, Andreas requested his parents to pay Daniel to teach him the intricacies of modeling. The parents approved, and during Andreas' training, Daniel unexpectedly caught the attention of Susan, Andreas' sister. Although some sources claim that Daniel and Susan met in kickboxing classes, this is untrue, as they already knew each other for a couple of months by the time they attended those classes. From the beginning, Daniel and Susan got along well, with some saying that opposites attract, and this was a perfect example. Susan came from a wealthy, well-educated family, while Daniel had a completely different upbringing, coming from an underprivileged and troubled family. Expelled from college for poor performance, Daniel, along with his older brother Christian, earned a living by doing repairs in a local garage. Susan, a well-groomed young girl from a cultured background, found Daniel's rebellious behavior unusual and intriguing. His scruffy appearance fascinated her, but unsure of how her parents would react to her relationship with Daniel, Susan decided to keep it a secret. However, 
As time passed, her parents learned that their daughter was dating the guy who came to teach Andreas. Initially unconcerned, her parents even allowed the meetings as Daniel claimed to be a law school student building model airplanes. Eventually, her parents discovered that Daniel wasn't enrolled anywhere, smoked daily, and consumed alcohol. Knowing that all parents want the best for their children, Manfred and Mauricia, hardworking and wealthy individuals, couldn't accept that their daughter was involved with someone like Daniel. However, the young couple had their unwitting ally and defender, Andreas. Adoring his sister and seeing a good friend in Daniel, Andreas often concealed their meetings. While the two enjoyed themselves in motels or spent time at Daniel's house, Andreas came up with elaborate schemes and excuses to shield and justify his sister, deflecting their parents' anger. Fatefully, Manfred and Mauricia went on a month-long vacation to Europe, leaving Susan and Andreas with full freedom in the house. Since Susan was 18, she had an excellent opportunity to prove her maturity to her parents. Instead, she secretly invited Daniel to stay in their home, where they spent the entire month by the pool, drinking and experimenting with various prohibited substances. Upon their return, the parents learned how their daughter spent her time in their absence. Over the next few weeks, there were disputes and arguments in the family, and after them, Susan became more and more determined. One day, she declared that her father could buy her and Daniel an apartment where the couple could live happily ever after. Of course, her father said no. Moreover, he said she could do whatever she wanted, but with her own money. And to these words, Manfred added the threat to cut off Susan's financial support. The girl became furious, but eventually she resigned herself to her defeat, or at least pretended to, as she continued to secretly meet with Daniel. What these two started planning was truly dreadful. On the 1st of November in 2002, early in the morning, the streets and the area around the residence where the von Richthofen family lived were filled with frantic screams. These screams of horror emanated from the family home because what the children discovered was shocking. Both Susan and Andreas had left the house the night before, but when they returned around 4 a.m., they witnessed a horrific scene. Their mother and father, Maricia and Manfred, were dead, and the police officers who arrived at the scene found the bodies of the spouses in their own bedroom. They had been brutally attacked while they slept, and judging by the items in the room, more than one method of murder was used. Mauricia and Manfred were beaten almost beyond recognition. Marks of strangulation were visible on his neck, and a trash bag covered the woman's head. It all looked as if the family had been robbed. Money was taken from a suitcase lying nearby, and from other places where apparently they were hidden. However, something didn't add up when officers began examining the property, rooms, and the office more thoroughly. For instance, the alarm system failed to alert the guards who were across the road at the time. Upon closer inspection, the alarm was found to be disabled, indicating that the killers must have known the code. Moreover, the police searched house seemed too tidy for a crime scene. All documents and papers were scattered in a seemingly even manner, not as a robber in haste would scatter them. And the list of inconsistencies and irregularities continued. There were no signs of forced entry, no electronic devices were stolen, and some rooms were not even entered, remaining untouched. What happened to the family, no one knew, and various speculations were made. The media, of course, focused their attention on Susan and Andreas. And as reported, Manfred and Mauricia's son was so distraught that he could hardly breathe. While Susan was also supposed to be grieving for her parents' death, she looked remarkably calm. During police interviews, it was revealed that the brother and sister spent the evening away from home. It turned out that on October 31st at 9 p.m., Susan took her 15-year-old brother out of the house to attend a party at an internet cafe without informing her parents who thought their son was sleeping at home. After dropping her brother off near the cafe, Susan rented a hotel room and warned Daniel that they could meet, try some substances, and have fun. However, by the early morning at 4 a.m., the brother and sister quietly returned home before their parents started getting ready for work and found them murdered in bed. Here, investigators began to have doubts. Susan's statements contradicted those of her brother Andreas, because unlike him, 
Susan indicated that her parents supported her relationship with Daniel, which, as we know, was a lie. On November 1st, 2002, the von Richthofen spouses were buried. Relatives, colleagues, and of course, the media attended the farewell ceremony. It was noted that Susan hardly cried during the funeral, unlike her brother. The girl's satisfied, unrestrained behavior raised suspicions. Rumors began to circulate that Susan had thrown a party at her home by the pool just three days after her parents were killed. In addition to this, it was noted how quickly her emotions shifted from grief during the funeral to joyous laughter during the poolside revelry. All of this raised significant suspicion among authorities. What particularly alarmed them was a substantial tip-off. Someone reported to the police about a suspicious purchase made by Daniel's brother, Christian Kravenhos. The purchase of a Suzuki motorcycle itself couldn't be deemed suspicious, but the fact that it was made at a local store just a few days after the murders occurred raised eyebrows. Christian, who was 26, paid for everything in cash, using large bills. This aroused suspicion because those who knew Daniel and Christian were aware that these guys were in dire financial straits. They had no steady jobs and were involved in alcohol and illegal substance use. Acting on the received information, officers brought Christian to the local police station where he was rigorously interrogated. Despite his seemingly unapproachable demeanor and claims of innocence, Christian eventually confessed to the murder of Manfred and Marisha. What's worse, it was revealed that Daniel and Susan helped him in this crime. According to Christian, Susan and his brother conspired to murder their parents so that they could finally live together. Furthermore, they planned to inherit the $17 million that would be left after their parents' death. The police immediately tracked down these two and began questioning them. Daniel shared his version of events, but his statements differed from what Susan had said. The girl claimed that money was not the primary motive. However, her boyfriend stated that significant money played a crucial role in his agreement to the crime. Despite their deep love for each other, they broke up almost immediately after the arrest. Although Susan was initially taken into custody, she was later released from prison pending trial, which did not commence for almost four years. While free, she was not heavily restricted in her actions and almost took control of the inheritance, interacting with lawyers. She also agreed to interviews with local media. During the recording, the girl cried, blamed everything on Daniel, and claimed that he had ruined her family. In the interview, Susan portrayed herself as a distraught and broken young girl who ended up in an unfortunate story due to her naivety. This performance, most likely aimed at improving her image, had the opposite effect. Lacking acting skills, Susan couldn't convince people of her innocence and victimhood. On July 17, 2006, Susan, Daniel, and Christian stood before the court, facing charges of first-degree murder. The jury was presented with very detailed information about what happened on Halloween, October 31, 2002. So, on the late evening of October 31st, Mauricia and Manfred were fast asleep. It was a Thursday, and they had spent most of the day at work. At 9 p.m., Andreas left home with Susan but his intentions were innocent enough for a 15-year-old boy. He just wanted to attend an online party. However, Susan had different, quite serious and horrifying plans. She returned home in her car with Daniel and Christian after dropping her brother off at the internet cafe. Even though the family's security guard noticed her, he wasn't alarmed. Susan checked on her parents to make sure they were asleep, and upon realizing that everything was quiet, she deactivated the home alarm. She then led the men into the living room, where they put on surgical gloves, donned hoods, and headed upstairs to the parents' bedroom with iron bars in hand. At that time, Susan sat on the luxurious sofa and turned on the television. Finding Marisha and Manfred asleep, the two brothers began assaulting the couple. Despite immense pain, the man and woman resisted, unwilling to die. They fought back. Desiring to quickly finish the task at hand, the brothers resorted to using towels found in the bathroom. This ended Manfred's life, but Mauricia was still alive. Daniel found a plastic bag and callously pulled it over the woman's head, tightening it ruthlessly. After a few minutes, 
Marisha stopped breathing. Once this was done, the trio staged a robbery, scattering several papers in the office and stealing all the money they could find. Then all three left the house. To establish alibis, Christian went to a fast food restaurant, making sure he was seen. Meanwhile, Daniel and Susan spent time at a hotel, indulging in pleasures, and later requested the bill as proof of their presence. At 3.30 a.m., Susan picked up Andreas from the party, returned to the family home, and pretended to be shocked upon discovering the horrifying scene. During the court proceedings, Susan blamed everything on Daniel, claiming that he constantly drugged her with some unknown substances, using her sedated state to coerce her into agreeing to murder. On the other hand, the Blood Brothers did not assert that they acted based on Susan's desires and plans. They also stated that they were protecting a girl who suffered from alcoholic parents, abusive towards her. It's worth mentioning that forensic analysis refuted all these claims. There was no alcohol found in Susan's parents' blood. Moreover, Susan failed to inspire trust, and the prosecutor branded her as the mastermind behind the crime. Susan was described as the perfect embodiment of an evil blonde, and the conclusion was drawn that all she wanted was to acquire the money and assets for which her parents had worked so hard. She desired freedom and independence. On July 22, 2006, just five days after the start of the trial, Susan, Daniel, and Christian were convicted of the murders of Manfred and Mauricia. Prosecutors demanded 50 years behind bars, but unfortunately, none of the three received such a sentence. In the end, Susan and Daniel were sentenced to 40 years of imprisonment, while Christian was sentenced to 38 years for conspiracy. As expected from someone as defiant as Susan, she attempted several times to mitigate and overturn her sentence. For example, in 2018, she sought freedom, citing a personality disorder that led her to commit the crime. Of course, her request was denied. Unfortunately, there were several tragic turns of events later on. For instance, Susan's brother Andreas never fully recovered from the death of his parents. In 2017, three neighbors were awakened in the middle of the night and found that their house had been broken into. A man lay on the floor. When the police arrived, he began claiming that he hadn't committed any violence. He was deeply frightened, saying he didn't care about his life. This man was Andreas. He roamed the streets with a family relic in his hands, and his legs were covered in scars. Shortly after, he was hospitalized in a special facility. The family home became vacant. In 2014, it was sold to unknown buyers who painted the entire facade white. Many in this story sympathize with Andreas. He had an excellent education and a bright future ahead. He had loving parents, but in an instant, he lost it all. His sister suddenly found herself behind bars, and his mother and father were dead. It's no wonder the guy plunged into the darkest corners of his mind. And although he was hospitalized, it is unclear how his life unfolded afterward. Despite murdering her parents, Susan will most likely inherit their money after serving her prison term. This means that with a 40-year sentence, she will be released around 2042 and will be a multi-millionaire. Even now, Susan and Daniel's sentences are being carried out in a semi-open regime. This means that they are allowed to leave the prison on special holidays and even for vacations. What's worse, Susan has already been seen at parties during conditional release. Apparently in Brazil, prisoners who have committed murders get leave. Thanks for watching. I recommend checking out other videos on my channel click now. Don't forget to hit the bell and subscribe to my channel. Hello, dear friends. It's Drake with you today. Let's dive into the story. Jasmine Kaur was born on September 14, 1999, in India, and became the first child to a woman named Rashpal Kaur. It's important to note that the word Kaur translates to princess, often used as a second name, but in today's narrative, it was her surname. After Jasmine, Rashpal had twin sons, Gurman and Sukmu. The children's father passed away when Jasmine was just six years old, and the family struggled to cope with this loss. In 2017, at the age of 18, Jasmine decided to embark on a journey to Australia in search of new opportunities, knowing that her relatives lived there. Her uncle, residing in Adelaide with his wife and daughter, warmly welcomed her, and Jasmine moved in with them. 
Driven by her interest in medicine and the desire to help others, Jasmine aimed to enter the University of South Australia. After passing exams, she enrolled in a nursing program, hoping to contribute to the family that took her in. Jasmine also took on the responsibility of preparing meals for them, showcasing remarkable culinary skills. But that wasn't all. Her aunt and cousin admired her fashion sense, and Jasmine, with her talent for makeup and fashion knowledge, willingly shared her expertise. Despite her young age, she proved to be a reliable, responsible, and conscientious young woman. The excellent upbringing and education provided by her parents complemented Jasmine's compassionate nature, making her an exemplary figure to those around her. Attached to her mother, she deeply missed her and regularly communicated with her and other close relatives, sharing details of her daily life. To gain practical experience before completing her medical studies, Jasmine took a job at a nursing home in the suburbs of Adelaide. It's believed that fate brought her together with Tarek Jot Singh there. Tarek Jot, born in 1999 in a village in the Indian state of Punjab, was the firstborn in his family. Over time, a second child joined the family. Mohan Singh, the father, worked as a farmer on a small plot where the family lived. The atmosphere at Tarek Jot's home was always tense, with Mohan Singh resorting to excessive cruelty to resolve conflicts, instilling fear in his sons. However, their mother provided a sanctuary, calming and comforting them. The brothers also cherished their maternal grandparents, feeling secure in their presence. Tarek Yot was noted for his immeasurable kindness and sincerity, uplifting everyone around him. In school, he excelled as a student, eager for new knowledge and never settling for mediocrity. In the senior classes, it was time for Tarek Jot to decide on his future education. Having scored high grades, he proved that he was on the right path to a promising career. By 2016, when Tarek Jot completed school, his grandparents managed to gather a small sum to help him relocate. Australia had long beckoned him, and he finally seized the opportunity to become a resident of charming Adelaide, as many young people did at that time. He successfully passed the standard English language test, a prerequisite for admission to the University of South Australia, and joined the ranks of students. Numerous directions and fields of study opened up before Tarek Yot. Contemplating his choices, he opted for information technology and set his sights on obtaining a bachelor's degree. Simultaneously, he had to work to support himself and progress further. For Tarek Jot, this was not a challenge. He explored various jobs, with most of them related to elderly care. Colleagues loved and respected him. Employers valued his honesty and kindness, always leaving positive reviews and recommendations for Tarek Jot. However, he continued to work diligently, and it soon became clear that showing compassion and helping the less fortunate was his true calling. Over time, Tarek Jot's fortunes improved. He saved up money and moved to a separate apartment in the city suburbs. There, he lived with another young man whom he quickly befriended. In 2018, when Tarek Jot and Jasmine first crossed paths, she had already achieved significant success in her profession. Colleagues praised her unwavering dedication and optimism, and her employer admired this sweet, kind-hearted girl. It's no wonder that Tarek Jot, who was loved for the same qualities, quickly bonded with Jasmine. Through workplace interactions and attending collective events together, their friendship blossomed into a romantic relationship, and by April 2020, they were a loving couple. Tarek Jot never hid his true intentions. Now, he openly declared that he saw in Jasmine the woman with whom he wanted to build a life and a strong family. However, over time, he became increasingly insecure. Tarek Jot suddenly doubted Jasmine's actions and motives, jealousy consumed him, and he began demanding detailed reports from her about where she had been and with whom she had interacted. He tried to control her every move, and if she planned to meet friends after work, he would instantly become furious. Persistent calls and unfounded accusations became part of his behavior, and one day he demanded that Jasmine leave her friends and return home immediately. For Jasmine, such a life became unbearable. Unable to endure it, she confided in her mother. Upon learning of the total control exerted by her daughter's suitor, 
the mother naturally disapproved of their relationship. However, Tarakjot paid no attention to others' objections, fully immersed in his own world, desiring assurance that his beloved would be with him for a lifetime. In October 2020, Tarakjot bought engagement rings and proposed to Jasmine. Despite disagreements and clear signs, she agreed to be his wife. However, the engagement did not calm Tarek Jot. It only heightened his suspicions. Now, using any available free time, he would appear unexpectedly at Jasmine's workplace with the sole purpose of keeping an eye on her. Experiencing the euphoria of the proposal, Jasmine regained her composure and began to reconsider her fiancé's behavior. Doubts plagued her, and the idea of ending the relationship increasingly occupied her thoughts. Realizing that her association with Tarek Yot negatively impacted her mental and emotional health, on January 4th, 2021, Jasmine informed him that they had to part ways. In response, she faced angry threats and words from Tarek Yot, claiming that if she left him, he would end his own life. The next day, after finishing work, Jasmine noticed Tarek Jot watching her from the window. During the break, she went to talk to him and he once again pleaded for her to stay. But she remained resolute in her decision. That's when Tarek Jot again started threatening self-harm and insisted that she would be responsible for anything that happened to him. On the same evening, Jasmine learned that Tarek Jot had taken a large amount of sleeping pills. She never took his words seriously and never thought he was capable of such actions. Concerned, she urgently contacted his apartment neighbor. The friend arrived and took Tarek Jot to the hospital where he wrote a statement claiming he had attempted suicide, but didn't take responsibility for that decision. In their breakup, Tarek Jot blamed Jasmine's family, insinuating that her relatives influenced her decision to end their relationship. The next morning on January 6, 2021, a psychiatrist examined Tarek Jot, finding no signs of mental illness, but concluding that the overdose was likely linked to an inability to cope with the relationship's breakup. Tarek Jot was discharged, but just a few hours later, the former fiancé unexpectedly appeared at Jasmine's home, insisting that she go with him to discuss something important. His real intention, however, was to persuade her to reconsider and restart the relationship. This attempt failed again as Jasmine refused, and in a desperate attempt to win her back, he threatened to publicly release their intimate video. Tarek Jot knew that this would be unbearable for Jasmine's respectable family. The manipulation did not achieve the desired effect, and faced with Jasmine's indifference, Tarek Jot sent the video to her mother. Shocked, Rashpal contacted her daughter who, as expected, was furious about the situation. The next day, the jealous ex showed up at Jasmine's workplace, standing next to his car and patiently waiting for her to finish her shift. Despite her ignoring him and simply leaving, he persisted. This time, Tarek Jot slowly followed her in his car, but suddenly abandoned the pursuit, allowing her to reach home undisturbed. Nevertheless, that night, emotionally exhausted, Jasmine couldn't sleep properly. Tarek Jot's pressure intensified every day, and each time, he threatened to share intimate videos with more people if she didn't return to him immediately. January 28, 2021, became a critical day for Jasmine. Unable to endure it any longer, she officially reported her ex-fiancé to the police for harassment. Every detail of their relationship was documented on paper. Given the seriousness of the case, the police initiated an investigation and met with Tarek Jot on February 9th to understand the situation. As a result, he received a warning for his unacceptable behavior. It's worth noting that by this point, Tarek Jot had developed a habit of composing text messages containing insults and mockery. And although most of these messages were never sent to Jasmine, they indicated the extent of his obsession. A few days later, the young man attempted suicide again, but his neighbor discovered him in time. When asked about the reasons for his actions in the hospital, Tarek Jot said he couldn't cope with the breakup and begged not to be hospitalized. Surprisingly, his plea was heeded and he was discharged under medical observation. A few days later, he began taking medication prescribed by doctors for depression, anxiety, and agitation. However, at the same time, thoughts of harming Jasmine became increasingly intrusive in his mind. 
focused and meticulous, Tarek Jot began developing his sinister plan. On March 4th, 2021, he managed to obtain a map marking the locations of almost all surveillance cameras in Adelaide. The next day, he inserted his SIM card into another phone and left it at home to create an alibi. To avoid being detected by cameras or recognized by anyone he knew, he temporarily borrowed his neighbor's blue jeep. On the same day, Tarek Jot purchased gloves, cable ties, and a shovel from a hardware store. The only thing he overlooked was that every move of his was recorded by surveillance cameras in the store. He then drove to Jasmine's workplace, where he waited for her to finish. Around 10 p.m., as she completed her shift and stepped onto a deserted street, unsuspecting of what awaited her, Tarek Jot suddenly attacked her. Grabbing her arms, he dragged her into the car. In the vehicle, he taped Jasmine's mouth and eyes, tied her hands and feet, and driving to a secluded spot, transferred his former fiance to the trunk of the car. He proceeded north, towards another city nearly 400 kilometers away from Adelaide. Between 10.30 p.m. and 3.30 a.m., throughout the entire route, five city surveillance cameras several times captured the car he was using. Upon reaching a location known only to him, Tarek Jot got out of the car and began digging a shallow grave near the road in this area. He then opened the trunk and attempted to injure Jasmine with a knife to the throat, but failing to inflict significant damage, he didn't complete the act. Instead, he lowered the girl into the grave and began burying her alive, all of this happening at dawn on March 6th. After burying her, Tarek Jot got back in the car, drove away, discarded Jasmine's belongings along with the remaining cable ties, tape, and other items, and disposed of the gloves and balaclava at a location known as the Death Rock. On the same day, noticing that Jasmine had not returned home, her family began to worry. When she did not show up for work, her employer became concerned, especially upon realizing that her car was still parked in front of the building. Unaware of Jasmine's whereabouts, her relatives contacted the authorities and filed a missing person report. For the detective in charge of the investigation, it seemed unlikely that the girl had left voluntarily. He was convinced that she was being held against her will. The detective reviewed surveillance footage at Jasmine's workplace, hoping to find a lead. Eventually, one recording from the last night featured a person near the building who, for most of the morning, drove towards another city. To accurately identify the suspect, authorities issued a public appeal to anyone with information about a young man around 20 years old who had contact with Jasmine or was in the vicinity in the days leading up to her disappearance. Unfortunately, no one came forward. On March 7th, investigators approached Tarek Jot to speak with him, considering the prior police reports about stalking. Initially, he denied any involvement in the girl's disappearance, but later, he told investigators that he and Jasmine had argued, and she allegedly attempted suicide. According to Tarek Jot, after his fiancée lost consciousness, he assumed she had died and buried her in a remote location. The following day, the apprehended suspect led the police to a gruesome pit where he had buried Jasmine's body. It was buried under a 30-centimeter layer of sand, with her hands tied behind her back, legs restrained with cable ties, and eyes and mouth taped shut. The victim's throat had been cut, but the wounds appeared to be superficial. The body was sent for forensic examination, and criminal charges were promptly filed against Tarek Jot. He was charged with failure to report the death of the girl, a mandatory requirement, which resulted in him being restricted from leaving his place of residence. The investigation was confident that he wouldn't attempt to flee. During a more detailed interrogation, serious inconsistencies emerged in Tarek Jot's statements, leading to his arrest. The autopsy report on Jasmine confirmed that she was still alive at the time of burial, and the cause of death was lack of air. These findings ultimately shed light on the horrifying nature of the events. On March 8, 2021, Tarek Jot was charged with murder and he was placed in pretrial detention. Despite asserting his innocence, he was denied bail. A few days later, a passerby discovered evidence, Jasmine's belongings. The prosecution requested a delay of at least nine months for case preparation against the alleged perpetrator. 
His first appearance in the Supreme Court was scheduled for March 2022, but Tarek Jot fell ill, tested positive for COVID-19, and instead, his lawyer appeared on his behalf, proclaiming his client's innocence and actively defending him. The trial was postponed until February 6, 2023, when Tarek Jot pleaded guilty in the Adelaide Supreme Court. He openly admitted to kidnapping Jasmine with the intention of taking her life. His confession spared the grieving family from the ordeal of a lengthy trial, which would have brought up very painful questions. Five months later, on July 5, 2023, in the South Australian Supreme Court, the judge handed down Tariq Jot's sentence life imprisonment with a non-parole period of 22 years and 10 months. This meant he could be eligible for parole. However, if released, Tariq Jot would have to leave the country. Before concluding the hearing, the judge explained to Tariq Jot the significance of his actions. He emphasized that the murder of Jasmine Kaur was premeditated and methodical, with the perpetrator fully aware of the monstrous nature of the act. The sentencing hearing took place on August 1, 2023, considering various factors such as age, mental health issues, and origin. The judge determined that the non-parole period should exceed 20 years. Tariq Jot was sentenced to life imprisonment with the possibility of parole after 22 years and 10 months. While this provided a measure of relief for the family, Rashpal expressed that she would never truly be happy again, as her greatest wish was for her daughter to be by her side. The grieving mother continued to miss their daily conversations and nightly wishes of good night, a routine they had shared for nearly 20 years. Despite justice prevailing, the fact that the perpetrator could potentially be released in just 22 years weighed heavily on them while they faced the rest of their lives without dear Jasmine. The close relatives of the deceased decided to create memorial spaces at home to never forget her pure soul and kind heart. Thanks for watching, and I recommend checking out other videos. Click now, and don't forget to hit the bell to stay updated on new stories. Until next time, take care. Greetings, dear subscribers. It is Drake here on the channel Crime Story Diaries. Statistics are relentless. The majority of murders eventually get solved. However, sometimes it takes many years before cases of brutal crimes, gathering dust in archives, finally come into the view of criminologists. Only the latest forensic techniques or chance witness testimonies shed light on long past misdeeds. The current case is yet another confirmation of this. The unexpected twist in this case was that the criminals themselves met their retribution, never having the chance to face trial. Bad Belzig is a provincial town with a population of just over 10,000 souls. Such remote places, where all residents are in plain sight, usually exhibit patriarchal customs and a low level of criminal activity. Therefore, the gruesome murder that will be discussed shook Bad Belzig to its core. The townspeople were extremely frightened. Dangerous criminals were among them, and the police could only shrug, having no leads. Today, we will delve into a truly shocking story, chilling with its bloody details. No one could have imagined the monstrous atrocities its perpetrators were capable of. Sometimes human nature presents horrifying surprises, casting doubt on the very concept of humanity. But let's proceed in order. Andrea Lohagen was born on January 6, 1977, in Bad Belzig. Her large and close-knit family, including her mother, father, and sister, resided in a new residential complex. From childhood, the girls were known for their obedience and diligence in studies, becoming a source of pride for their parents. By the age of 16, Andrea blossomed into a true beauty and a school star with a multitude of admirers. However, Apart from studying and attending parties with friends, the girls did not engage in anything reprehensible. October 7, 1993, was the penultimate day of autumn break for 16-year-old Andrea. On that day, she was strolling with her parents in a shopping center near their home. The high school girl was on the home stretch of her school marathon. Ahead was only the final year with exams and the long-awaited entry into adult life. Andrea dreamed of attending university building a career, and starting a family. 
She had only one more year of schooling left, which was a very exciting prospect for her. Andrea realized that a completely new stage of life was about to begin, and this thought immensely inspired her. In the shopping center, the girl bought new shoes and jeans, eagerly anticipating the party at the club to show off her new acquisitions. That evening, high school student Andrea was planning to go to the local youth center, where a group of friends and acquaintances awaited her. The club was just a 15-minute leisurely walk from the Lohagen family home. Living in the small, patriarchal Bad Belzig, parents never worried about letting their daughter go alone to such parties. Everyone felt safe here, as there had never been any attacks or crimes in the town before. This time, Andrea was supposed to return from the club around 10 p.m. to make it in time for watching another horror movie, which she was accustomed to watching in the evenings with her mother. However, at the appointed hour, the beauty did not show up at home. Initially, it was assumed that Andrea would be delayed for a couple of hours with friends and then return as usual. But her friends at the party never saw the girl, which greatly alarmed them. Such an uncharacteristic delay for responsible Andrea did not align with her usual punctual behavior. She had never allowed herself to be late before. Contacting her directly was problematic. At that time, mobile phones were not widely used, and there was no landline phone at the youth center. To call Andrea at home, her friends would have to leave the party themselves first. Nevertheless, the group decided not to jump to conclusions and stayed at the club. Assuming that Andrea might have had some domestic issues and her parents did not allow her to attend the party. Although the youth center was nearby, none of the friends even attempted to check on the latecomer. The girls simply assumed that she was delayed or grounded at home and continued to enjoy themselves. However, when Andrea did not return home by midnight, her mother became truly worried. Usually by this time, her daughter would already be home watching another horror movie with her. Initially, the woman thought that the high school student had simply lost track of time with her friends or had briefly visited someone for tea. But as the clock struck well past midnight and Andrea did not show up, the mother became genuinely alarmed. She tried to contact the group of friends with whom her daughter was supposed to have fun that evening. However, none of them were at home and it was impossible to find out anything about Andrea's whereabouts. Only later did one of the girls finally answer the call, but she had no information about the missing girl. The mother realized that her daughter could not have been delayed for so long. The next day, she had school. At 1 a.m., the parental nerves could not take it anymore, and the worried woman decided to embark on a search for her beloved daughter. Waking up her husband, the couple set out in their car at 1.30 a.m. to try to find Andrea. For hours, the relatives searched the surroundings of the small, bad Belzig, but the search was unsuccessful. They visited the youth center, but their daughter was not there, and her friends from the group could not clearly explain where she might have disappeared, on the way to the club or on the way back. By that time, most of the partygoers had already dispersed, and the remaining youths could not provide much information. Ultimately, closer to 4 a.m., the frantic parents turned to the local police with a report of their daughter's disappearance. Unfortunately, their signal was met with extreme reluctance by the law enforcement officers. No one deemed it necessary to immediately start searching for the missing high school student. The officers believed that the girl had simply gone out somewhere and would return home on her own in the morning, sobered up. However, Andrea's parents were convinced that a huge disaster had befallen their daughter. They knew that the girl could not have run away from home or failed to return on her own accord. There was simply no reason for that. All her belongings and money were left at home. Andrea had no romantic relationships and her friends had not seen her that evening. The police only began investigating a week later when the girl still did not show up. Until that moment, the search had been solely conducted by the parents, combing through every corner of the town. The missing girl's family called all the hospitals in the area, but no information about a girl resembling Andrea had been received. During the unsuccessful search efforts, the parents' attention was drawn to a suspicious plot of land that once belonged to the grandfather of Andrea's former boyfriend. The couple had broken up shortly before the incident, 
and the young man was rumored to be deeply affected by the breakup. The outside of the plot seemed abandoned, but the parents' gaze caught an inconspicuous old shed. The mother and father speculated that the ex-boyfriend could be involved in their daughter's disappearance. Perhaps he ambushed her somewhere on the way to the club, attacked her and abducted her. The parents immediately contacted the suspected perpetrator, but he dismissed any suspicions. The young man claimed that he had spent the entire evening and night at home, and his relatives were willing to confirm that. Nevertheless, Andrea's family was inclined not to trust their daughter's former suitor. Receiving a lead from Andrea's parents about the suspicious plot belonging to her ex-boyfriend's grandfather, the police promised to investigate this lead. Finally, a week after the girl's disappearance, investigators took the investigation seriously. Detectives began questioning all the visitors of the youth club where Andrea was supposed to go on that fateful evening. Among the party guests were many friends and acquaintances of the victim, but their testimonies did not clarify the case. Many of the teenagers frequented the club daily, confused about dates and days, making their accounts convoluted and chaotic. Some claimed to have seen Andrea at the party, while others denied her presence. Investigators initially leaned towards the version that the girl arrived at the establishment, but disappeared later, getting lost in the crowd, possibly leaving with someone familiar or falling victim to an attack. This scenario seemed quite plausible. Alcohol is often present in teenage environments at parties, which can lead to various incidents on the way home. However, after speaking with other witnesses of the events that night, it became clear that Andrea never appeared at the youth center. As confirmed by her friends who were waiting for her, the high school beauty did not show up for the meeting. Detectives considered the testimonies of Andrea's closest circle to be the most reliable. All presumed routes of the victim's movement towards the club were immediately scrutinized by patrols. Search and rescue operations involved trained search dogs and numerous volunteers. However, despite the truly massive scale, Andrea's traces were not found. Numerous press conferences and television reports were broadcast, urging citizens to provide any information about the missing girl and to warn of possible danger. The girl's parents and law enforcement did everything possible to shed light on the mysterious disappearance. Appeals were made to negotiate in case of abduction, hotlines were activated to receive signals from witnesses, and monetary rewards were announced. Unfortunately, all efforts proved futile. The investigation did not have any substantial evidence or leads. Numerous pieces of information received after thorough verification turned out to be false repeatedly. The only achievement of the detectives at that time was to roughly reconstruct the chronology of events preceding the girl's disappearance. Around 6 p.m. on that fateful Thursday, October 7, 1993, Andrea returned from the shopping center with her parents. At home, she retreated to her room, played her favorite music, and eagerly examined the new outfits she had acquired. Later, the whole family gathered for dinner, and after the meal, Andrea planned to go to a party at the youth club. Initially, the girl tried to contact her friend to go to the event together, but she couldn't reach the friend who was already there. Therefore, Andrea decided to go to the club alone. Her parents knew nothing about her further movements. Investigators speculated that Andrea could have fallen victim to a sexual assault. The sight of a fashionable, well-groomed, attractive girl could have triggered the excited imagination of a maniac or predator, leading them to commit a crime. Detectives closely examined the circle of acquaintances of the missing girl, establishing a list of all her ex-boyfriends and admirers. However, a thorough check revealed that all potential suspects had solid alibis. For example, many young men were present at the same party and could not have been involved in the attack. Unfortunately, at that time, the surveillance system was still in its infancy, significantly complicating the investigation. Detectives began searching for possible witnesses to the incident. It was discovered that on that evening, Andrea chose a shortened route to the club where several witnesses saw her. According to their testimonies, at some point, the girl crossed paths with a group of young people and then with a couple of teenagers However, Andrea was not closely acquainted with any of these people, 
so she simply continued on her way. The last ones who saw the high school girl alive were two boys aged 13, 14 named Robin and David. According to German law, their identities and photos are not disclosed. Detectives located these teenagers and took their statements. It turned out that they simply nodded to the girl and went their separate ways. After that, Andrea seemed to vanish into thin air. It became evident that the girl never reached the meeting place with her friends. Therefore, something tragic happened to her on the way, on that inconspicuous side path that significantly shortened the route. Only the residents of the nearby houses were familiar with this little-known forest path. Accordingly, the search for the culprits needed to be narrowed down to this contingent of local residents. Immediately, the police focused on those same teenagers, Robin and David, the last ones who saw Andrea alive. Robin and David came from troubled families and lived nearby, not far from the Lohagen family's home. They were well acquainted with the side path that Andrea followed. It was their frequent route. Despite their young age, the boys already had a criminal past. They had been repeatedly suspected of minor thefts with break-ins. Nevertheless, there were no substantial grounds to accuse the teenagers of such a serious crime as assault and abduction. Ultimately, all suspicions against them were lifted due to their minor status. The case hit a dead end, and for the next seven years, the situation remained stagnant. But on July 7, 2000, a local resident witnessed a grim discovery. During a walk, his dog brought a human skull, guarding the gruesome find by placing it on the ground. At that moment, the man was on the phone with a friend and initially mistook the skull for a ball, not discerning its true nature. However, once he hung up, the man realized that it was a genuine human skull, long devoid of flesh. The skull had a hole pierced through the occipital bone. Initially, the resident assumed that the dog had stumbled upon ancient remains from the time of World War II. Burials from that era were often found in those areas. However, as a precaution, he reported the find to the police. When the information reached the detectives, they immediately went to the scene with search dogs. It turned out that the location where the skull was found was the former boyfriend's property that Andrea's mother had previously pointed to. After several hours of thorough searching, behind the door of a partially collapsed shed, buried under a pile of construction debris, a complete human skeleton was discovered. Due to the dismal condition of the remains, their initial identification was impossible. Moreover, the search of the utility building yielded absolutely no clues, no personal belongings, no fragments of the victim's clothing, no evidence. In recent years, no one had truly disappeared without a trace in Bad Belzig, except for Andrea Lohagen. Therefore, most immediately assumed that the found remains belonged to her, the girl's parents detailed the outfit she was wearing at the time of her disappearance, new black platform shoes and jeans purchased on the day of the tragedy. However, no trace of this clothing was found in the shed. Apparently, the perpetrators disposed of it. It was also not ruled out that shortly before her death, Andrea's clothes could have been torn off, for example, in an attempted assault. Identifying the remains as belonging to Andrea was only possible after a thorough forensic examination including analysis of dental records. In the end, the horrific truth was established. Seven years later, literally in plain sight, the skeleton of the missing girl, who had been searched for throughout the town, was discovered. Next to the very youth center where Andrea was heading on that fateful evening, her remains were found by the investigation. Finally, the relatives learned the grim truth about the girl's fate and were able to bury her properly. However, questions immediately arose. How diligently were the initial searches conducted if the body had been right under their noses all these years? Reviewing the reports of the search operation revealed that this area, including the abandoned shed with piles of debris, had already been inspected by the investigators. However, nothing suspicious was found inside. Perhaps the victim's body was hidden there much later, but there was no documentary evidence to confirm this. Detectives recalled the testimonies of witnesses who indicated that the last time Andrea was seen was in the company of two teenagers aged 13, 14, Robin and David. Soon after meeting this pair, the girl disappeared without a trace, 
which seemed suspicious to the investigation even during the initial inquiry. The boys were interrogated again, and they reiterated that they had seen Andrea on that fateful night, simply greeted her, but had no connection to her disappearance. Unfortunately, during the inspection of the shed and the forensic examination, the criminalist could not find any evidence or traces indicating close contact between the suspects and the victim. It seemed highly unlikely that such young boys could become murderers and deal with the high school girl. However, all threads led to them, and it was impossible to completely rule out their involvement. Upon closer scrutiny, it was revealed that these adolescents had a clear connection to the location where Andrea's remains were found. Witnesses often observed Robin and David in close proximity to the ill-fated shed. Furthermore, it was established that the boys had access to the interior of the abandoned structure. There are also testimonies from eyewitnesses that on the evening of the girl's disappearance, the teenagers were seen precisely at the entrance to the shed. This gave rise to new questions and exacerbated suspicions of their involvement in the crime. Despite the discovered link of the teenagers Robin and David to the crime scene, the authorities at that time ceased the investigation into their involvement. The primary argument was the lack of sufficient evidence and the too young age of the potential suspects, which led the detectives to simply not believe in the schoolboy's involvement in the murder. The investigation into Andrea Lohagen's disappearance, however, continued. Yet, neither the authorities, nor the mass media, nor the victim's own family were able to obtain any valuable information capable of shedding light on the case. The detectives' efforts reached a dead end, and soon the materials of the heinous crime were permanently buried in the shelves of the Unsolved Cases Department. Only the absence of any direct evidence pointing to the killer forced the detectives to cease their fruitless search for years. It was only in 2012 when new leadership emerged in the Regional Police Department that renewed interest was shown in the long, cold case of Andrea Lohagen's disappearance. During the reopened investigation, detectives managed to uncover some new evidence and leads. However, there still lacked substantial proof to charge a specific individual. The detectives did not have a prime suspect in sight. The situation changed dramatically only in 2016. In May of that year, 37-year-old David passed away in Berlin, one of those very teenagers who had last seen Andrea alive. The cause of death was serious pancreatic problems, brought on by years of drug addiction and an antisocial lifestyle. During one of his train trips, David suddenly suffered a severe internal hemorrhage, which proved fatal. The death certificate cited natural causes, but the deceased had a long criminal history. Suddenly, a witness came forward to law enforcement, claiming to be able to help solve the long-standing case of Andrea Lohagen's murder, as they were privy to all its details. This witness turned out to be the own mother of the recently deceased David. The woman confessed that for all these years, she had kept a terrible secret about her son's involvement in the brutal murder of the local beauty. According to her account, on that October evening in 1993, 14-year-old David and his 13-year-old friend Robin were walking along the same path and encountered Andrea. Noticing her fashionable attire, the delinquent youths decided to attack and rob the 16-year-old girl. In the darkness, Andrea recognized her tormentors, and fearing exposure, the scoundrels cold-bloodedly killed her. This turn of events stunned the investigators, as they had previously suspected this pair of schoolboys, but lacked evidence for prosecution, and the young age of the potential killers cast doubt on their involvement. Until then, Robin and David had only minor criminal offenses, repeatedly escaping punishment due to their minority. No one could have imagined that impunity would so embolden the teenagers, 36-year-old Robin was immediately brought in for questioning. By that time, his former accomplice was no longer alive, so the police had to rely solely on the words of the surviving criminal. Robin, relieved, confessed to everything, recounting the gruesome details. He expressed a desire to first speak with his family, confess to them, and only then provide final testimony to the investigation. Appreciating the testimony of the key witness, 
the detectives agreed to give Robin 48 hours to meet with his family. They had no inkling that the 36-year-old man had already made up his mind. Upon returning to his apartment, where his wife was temporarily absent, Robin left a final message for his wife and a note for the police, detailing the attack on Andrea Lohagen. And then he disappeared without a trace. Two days later, with Robin failing to show up, he was declared missing. On November 4th, 2016, the body of the sought-after man was discovered by one of the hunters in the mountains. The mutilated body of the 36-year-old man lay at the bottom of a deep ravine. Robin had voluntarily ended his life, apparently unable to bear the burden of guilt for the crime he committed in his youth. In his final note, Robin described the horrifying details of that senseless crime. He himself never understood the true motives of his friend David, who was the instigator of the attack. Subsequently, David never explained to his friend why he suddenly decided to assault an unknown solitary girl. But Robin meticulously recounted the other details of the incident. The killer confessed. They had never been acquainted with Andrea Lohagen before. The victim was a random passerby. The attack was a sudden, spontaneous outburst of aggression. That evening, the teenagers simply crossed paths with the girl as she walked along a side path to the club. Presumably, Andrea chose that route to hurry to a party and save time. As Robin recalled, when he and David met Andrea, they exchanged innocuous greetings with her. Robin himself intended to continue on his way home, but suddenly his friend, as if breaking free, pounced on the unsuspecting girl. For Robin, this action was a shocking surprise. After dealing with the victim, the teenagers secretly buried her body in an outbuilding near the youth center, covering it with construction debris before fleeing the crime scene. According to the killer, they had no selfish motive to rob or assault Andrea. It was an act of pure, senseless cruelty, aggression of monstrous proportions. As Robin's testimonies revealed, he and David had close contact with drug dealers during their school years. Moreover, on that fateful night, the teenagers were also under the influence of drugs. Peter Lemon, the head of the youth center where Andrea was supposed to go, remembered this splendid girl well. According to him, the beauty was a regular visitor to the establishment, behaved impeccably, did not consume alcohol, and mainly came here to play billiards and socialize with friends. The violence against Andrea was a huge shock for Peter, and he cooperated fully with the investigation. Lemon had also heard about two young teenagers who often loitered near the shed a couple of hundred meters from the club. Unpleasant rumors circulated about these boys, however. Peter could not fathom that such young individuals were capable of such a heinous crime. Now it turned out that these very hardened juveniles had been roaming free for 20 years, having committed murder. In addition to Robin's written confession, and witness testimonies indicating the presence of the boys near the crime scene, as well as David's mother's words, the investigation still lacked direct substantial evidence against the suspects. No DNA, no fingerprints. The detectives had to meticulously scrutinize every word of Robin, analyzing their social media exchanges and gadget contents. The investigators hoped to find some indirect confirmation of discussing the crime or admission to it. Shortly before his death, ominous posts resembling hints of his involvement in the mystery of Andrea's disappearance were discovered on David's accounts. Presumably, the man was aware of the reopened investigation and was tormented by guilt. Although he had no intention of openly surrendering to the authorities, his life had already taken a downward spiral due to drug addiction. David's mother interpreted her son's death as a sign from fate. Previously, the woman had feared turning her offspring over to the police and had pitied him, and Robin, in turn, hesitated to make revelations, fearing retaliation from his former accomplice. These fears were not unfounded. In David's criminal past, there were not only minor drug-related offenses, but also violent episodes. Indirectly, the horrific crime of their youth was also hinted at by findings on David's social media pages. But he was already dead, which relegated the discovered leads to the role of secondary evidence. Nevertheless, even with the accumulation of discovered indirect evidence and details, there remained one circumstance that instilled the greatest horror in the detectives. 
How could two ordinary boys aged 13 and 14 possess such savage bloodthirstiness and cruelty, allowing them to commit such a monstrous crime? Against this backdrop, suspicions crept in among the relatives of the slain Andrea and the investigators themselves regarding the possible involvement of a third adult accomplice in the crime, a certain elder mentor who could have been directing the young accomplices. It is known that the girl's death resulted from a severe cranial injury inflicted by a blunt object. Her skull was literally shattered from behind, requiring significant physical strength. The detectives doubted that even two teenagers of that age could muster enough brute force to overpower an older girl and inflict such a serious injury. The version of the adult accomplice's involvement was indirectly supported by other details that emerged during the investigation. At that moment, a new potential suspect emerged for the detectives. A man closely associated with Robin and David's company and significantly older than them. However, the investigators did not disclose this man's name. Neither in the pre-death note nor in Robin's oral testimonies did he mention a third accomplice. David's mother also denied such a possibility. However, some indirect witness testimonies, on the contrary, pointed to the involvement of an outsider adult. For instance, witnesses described a truck driver of approximately the same age, whom they saw near the ill-fated shed around the same time Andrea disappeared. The identity of this person was established, and the investigators directly linked him to the incident surrounding the girl's disappearance. In reality, all three teenagers, Andrea herself, and her future killers, Robin and David, attended the same school. Due to the age difference, they did not cross paths in the same classes, did not have common activities or friends. Perhaps they occasionally bumped into each other in the hallways or school cafeteria. It could not be ruled out that there were previous conflicts between Andrea and the juvenile delinquents living nearby. Perhaps this fueled the hateful feelings of the embittered teenagers towards the girl? Both boys grew up in troubled families early on developing a penchant for alcohol and illicit substances. It is possible that on that fateful night, they were also under the influence of intoxicating toxins, which could have heightened their unrestrained aggressiveness. One striking detail was that Andrea's remains were discovered on a plot belonging to a relative of one of the killers, the grandfather of the victim's former boyfriend. Some considered this too specific a coincidence speculating on the involvement of the ex-boyfriend in the incident. The public was outraged when the truth about the teenager's involvement in the murder came to light. People were dismayed that in the 90s, detectives had halted the investigation solely due to the young age of the potential suspects. In the small town of Bad Belzig, where everyone knew each other, school children were previously suspected of involvement in Andrea's disappearance. Due to gossip and dissatisfaction from neighbors, David's family was soon forced to relocate after the tragedy. If the detectives had continued to focus on the teenagers at that time, the victim's body would have been found much earlier. This would have allowed for a timely assessment of the true extent of their crime and holding the juvenile killers accountable in time. As known, the autopsy results revealed a fracture in Andrea's skull, but the exact object used to inflict the injury could not be identified. The investigation only had the small bones of the decomposed skeleton of the girl to rely on. In the absence of direct physical evidence, the investigation had to rely on David's mother's testimonies and Robin's notes. After the investigation was reopened, a crucial question arose for the detectives. Had these juvenile criminals committed any new crimes while free during those long 20 plus years? It was unlikely, but the possibility could not be ruled out. Among the local residents, no one recalled any new serious incidents involving them. However, David and Robin had a long history of minor criminal episodes, which the detectives delved into extensively. This process revealed new sinister secrets of the teenage group. By the time suspicions arose about Robin's involvement in a new heinous incident, the detectives became aware of the horrifying circumstances. On January 11, 2014, a French exchange student named Louise did not return from a meeting with friends at the university hospital. A few minutes before leaving home, 
she had a phone call with one of her friends, arranging a time and place. However, Louise never showed up at the agreed location. Her friends tried to reach her, but her phone remained unanswered. Eventually, they assumed Louise had urgent matters and went home. However, the next day, Louise did not show up for work without explanation, which was unusual for her. She was known to be very responsible. In the evening, her phone remained unreachable and her whereabouts could not be determined. Later, Louise's body was found. The main suspect in her murder was none other than Robin, the same juvenile killer of Andrea Lohagen, who took his own life just as the police managed to reopen his old case. The coincidence was truly ominous. It turned out that Louise was personally acquainted with Robin. The French girl had no idea who she had gotten involved with, and as a result, paid with her life, likely becoming the second victim of the ruthless criminal. However, just like in Andrea's case, proving Robin's involvement in Louise's murder proved to be extremely challenging. The investigation simply lacked sufficient direct evidence. The case of the French student's murder officially remained unsolved. Many saw the root of evil precisely in the negligence of the law enforcement officers, who in 1993 had halted the investigation into the involvement of the two juvenile teenagers in Andrea's murder, citing their underage status. Such carelessness simply unleashed the future criminals and allowed them to commit new crimes in the future. With a high degree of probability, Robin did indeed kill Louise. Due to the fact that his criminal trail had been neglected in the past, the searches were unsuccessful, and the case ended up gathering dust on distant archival shelves. Andrea's body had decomposed in plain sight, and many years later, Louise was left unattended, a life that could have been easily saved. Can it be said that the juvenile killers ultimately received their deserved punishment for their crimes? The Lohagen family believes not, despite the fact that the criminals themselves lived freely for not so long before their deaths. During that time, nothing prevented them from leading a full life, carrying out simple everyday tasks, the very joys that innocent Andrea was cruelly deprived of. The exact motives for her murder, like many other details of that ancient tragedy, remain shrouded in mystery to this day behind the seven locks of unproven facts and silence. This case demonstrated how dangerous it is to underestimate the criminal potential even of the youngest suspects. The negligence of the investigation, which disregarded leads solely because of Robin and David's minority in 1993, allowed the two juvenile killers to develop their bloody inclinations and evade justice for many years. The monstrous cruelty displayed by the teenagers in the murder of the random passerby Andrea still leaves one in shock. Often, even adult criminals are not capable of such senseless and inhumane aggression. And yet the perpetrators turned out to be nothing more than immature youths. One can only speculate on what monstrous beasts Robin and David could have become if their criminal path had not been interrupted. Perhaps there would have been many more innocent victims on their conscience, similar to the unfortunate Louise. The belated revelation of the truth about Andrea's murder underscored the importance of ensuring that no crime goes unsolved. For sooner or later, the truth will come to light. But by that time, restoring justice may be impossible. At the same time, the story of the slain young woman serves as a poignant reminder of the preciousness of every human life. The radiant brilliance of Andrea's youth, her dreams and aspirations for the future, all of it was senselessly snatched away from her in a moment of wild, bestial aggression. All that remains is to express sympathy and solidarity with the grief of Andrea's family, for whom the oft-repeated adage, nothing passes without a trace, has become a hollow slogan. Even after the perpetrators were identified, a full triumph of justice never truly materialized. Ultimately, the villainy of Robin and David never received a definitive legal assessment, as the criminals themselves departed from this life by their own hand. All that is left is to shudder at the horrors that even a child's soul is capable of, stepping onto the slippery path of crime. In the dark alleys of the criminal world, 
desperate wrongdoers are ready to go to the most unthinkable lengths to mitigate their punishment, or, with a lucky turn of events, escape the punishing hand of justice altogether. However, sometimes their methods are so frightening and repulsive that they make even the seasoned inhabitants of the criminal underworld shudder. Today's story will tell us about how the Guardians of Order hunted for a true virtuoso of impersonation and improvisation whose deeds shook all of Italy. Veronica Panarello, a young woman whose life was full of trials, grew up in sunny Italy. A fateful meeting took place when she was barely 16. In one of the bars, she met a charming guy named Davide Stivel. Despite the four-year age difference, a spark immediately ignited between them. Veronica, enchanted by her new acquaintance, opened her heart to him that very evening. The young age of the schoolgirl did not become an obstacle to their relationship. Just three months after their passionate meetings, Veronica was already dreaming of starting a family with her beloved. She was firmly convinced that she wanted to have a child with him. David, succumbing to the pressure of his young girlfriend, agreed to this responsible step. Soon the lovers began to live together, and Veronica was delighted to discover that she was carrying their firstborn under her heart. In 2006, a long-awaited son was born, whom they named Loris. At that time, Veronica had just turned 18, and Davide was 21 years old. The family life of the young couple was not easy. Veronica's parents did not approve of their daughter's early marriage and her decision to have a child while still being a girl herself. Constant conflicts with relatives prompted Veronica to leave her parental home with relief. The birth of little Loris out of wedlock only added fuel to the fire and became an additional reason for reproaches from the older generation. However, contrary to their gloomy predictions, Veronica managed to build a semblance of a family hearth. Despite her young age and all the difficulties, the life of the young parents flowed in its own way. Alas, a treacherous fate was already preparing a fatal turn for them. But while the storm had not yet struck, Veronica made every effort to provide her firstborn with a decent life. Over time, the lovers officially registered their marriage, and sometime later their family was again replenished. A second son was born, named Diego. The financial situation of the Stivel couple left much to be desired. Veronica was actually still dependent on her parents. Although David worked, his modest earnings were barely enough to feed his wife and two children. Fortunately, relatives from both sides did not leave the young family without support and help them with money. Veronica herself did not even think about finding a job. She devoted all her time and energy to caring for the children and household chores. Davide could not stop admiring his industrious, neat and loving wife, who was the most caring mother to their sons. But behind the outward well-being of the young family lurked the ominous shadow of an impending tragedy. No one could even imagine what terrible events would soon shake the quiet Italian town and forever change the fate of Veronica, Davide and their children. This grim story will once again prove that sometimes terrible secrets can be hidden behind a mask of decency and a mother's love can turn into a blood-curdling nightmare. As Veronica's sons grew up, their relationship with their mother seemed warm and cordial to those around them. The young woman devoted all her free time to her children, but sometimes their communication resembled a friendship between peers rather than the usual bond between mother and child. The reason probably lay in the excessively young age at which Veronica had to experience the joys and burdens of motherhood. Many noticed that even after becoming a mother of two sons, Veronica still had not gotten rid of the rebellious moods inherent in teenagers. It was on this basis that she increasingly had fierce conflicts with her parents. The older generation feared that their daughter would not be able to become a full-fledged mother if she perceived her responsibilities as some kind of game. However, any attempts to reason with the young woman invariably ended in violent tantrums on her part. The Stivel family settled in a small rural settlement of Santa Croce on sunny Sicily, located in southern Italy. In this cozy town, whose population barely reached 10,000 people, everyone knew each other by sight. Despite the charm of provincial life, such early motherhood, as in Veronica's case, was a rarity here and caused surprise among the local residents. No one could have imagined that this reckless youthful impulse, which led to the birth of little Loris, 
would eventually turn into a brutal tragedy that we are about to tell. The fateful day of November 29th, 2014 began for Veronica Panarello as usual. Around one o'clock in the afternoon, she hastily entered the doors of the police station to report the disappearance of her eight-year-old son, Loris. The agitated young mother told the guardians of order that in the early morning, as always, she had taken the boy to school. According to her, she personally drove her son right up to the doors of the educational institution and saw him join the other children and disappear inside the building. After that, Veronica took the younger child to kindergarten and went about her business. Loris was supposed to stay in classes until half past one in the afternoon. When the worried mother appeared at the school again to pick up her son, he was nowhere to be seen. Veronica searched the entire neighborhood but was unable to find a trace of her firstborn. Without wasting a minute, she decided to turn to the police for help and write a statement about the missing child. The law enforcement officers immediately contacted the school administration, but neither the teachers nor other employees of the educational institution had seen Loris on that fateful day. The boy's classmates also unanimously claimed that they had not met him either near the school or in the classroom. Most decided that young Stivel was simply skipping classes. Someone even suggested that the child could have been kidnapped on the way to school. However, no one believed that Loris, who was smart beyond his years, could voluntarily get into a car with a stranger. And then the main question arose. How could the boy disappear without a trace on the way to school if his mother personally brought him to the doors of the educational institution and saw him go inside? It was up to the investigators to find the answer to this puzzle, because the life of young Loris was at stake. Meanwhile, the most terrible assumptions were swarming in Veronica's head. Could something bad have happened to her son? Or perhaps there was someone's malicious intent behind his disappearance? The young woman was worried sick, mentally praying that her boy would be alive and unharmed. She did not yet know that in just a few hours, a horrifying discovery would forever turn her life upside down and mark the beginning of one of the most mysterious and shocking investigations in the history of Italian criminology. While these tragic events were unfolding, Veronica's husband, 29-year-old David, was in Rome on business. Being a driver, he was just making another trip away from home, where his 25-year-old wife was face to face with the disappearance of their son. The guardians of order, without wasting time, contacted the father of the missing boy. David was extremely surprised by the call from the police because, as it turned out, Veronica did not even consider it necessary to inform him about what had happened. Shocked by the news, the man immediately dialed his wife's number. In a trembling voice, Veronica confirmed that Loris was missing and she could not find him. Without a second thought, David dropped everything and took the first flight from Rome to be with his wife as soon as possible in this difficult moment. But as soon as he landed in his hometown, a terrible post on social media caught his eye. On the phone screen, a photo of Veronica with their son and an announcement that the boy had been found dead appeared. David's heart sank with pain and despair. Just four hours ago, his wife had reported the child missing, and now their son was already dead. The body of little Loris was found in a shallow ditch near an old abandoned mill located just a few minutes drive from the Stivel couple's house. The terrible discovery was made completely by chance by an elderly hunter who, as usual, was combing the surrounding forests in search of game. Noticing something suspicious at the bottom of the ditch, the man approached closer and realized with horror that it was not garbage in front of him but the mutilated body of a child. Without wasting a minute, he contacted the police and reported his gruesome find. The forensic experts who arrived at the scene discovered the tortured body of the boy unnaturally twisted at the bottom of the ditch. The child's clothes were in disarray, his pants were slightly pulled down, and his underwear was completely absent. This fact immediately led the investigators to think that the reason for the violence against the boy could have been a sexual motive. The police suggested that the killer was a dangerous pedophile who not only abused a defenseless child, but also ruthlessly took his life. Usually, such perverts do not go that far, 
limiting themselves to only mocking their victims. But this criminal was an exception to the rule and posed a double threat to society. The news of the brutal murder of a child instantly spread through the quiet town of Santa Croce and plunged the local residents into shock and panic. People were afraid to let their children out into the street, fearing that a pedophile maniac could strike again at any moment. Every family in the town felt defenseless in the face of such a predator. The tragedy of little Loris instantly became the main news in the Italian media. The country's central TV channels incessantly reported what had happened, and the shocking details of the brutal murder stirred the minds of the public. People demanded that the police catch the pervert as soon as possible so that he could face the punishment he deserved. The investigators working on this high-profile case tirelessly searched for the monster who had taken the life of an innocent child. In order to somehow reassure the agitated residents of Santa Croce, the police hastened to assure that they would make every effort to apprehend the killer. However, from the very beginning, there were some oddities in this crime that did not fit into the typical scheme of the actions of maniacs and rapists. The most frightening thing was that the killer had removed the victim's underwear, but then put the pants back on. Such perverts sometimes take the belongings of their victims as trophies, but they almost never bother to put them back on. Moreover, there had previously been no recorded cases of sexual violence against children in this quiet area. All these facts made the investigators doubt that they were dealing with an ordinary pedophile. The police's attention was drawn to the family of the deceased boy. Veronica and David were considered decent and loving spouses who adored their children. Despite the fact that their firstborn was born when Veronica had just turned 18, now she was already an adult and responsible mother. The police decided to take a closer look at the parents of the murdered child, because sometimes the closest people can shed light on the circumstances of the tragedy. Talking to the Stivel couple, the investigators found out that due to the specifics of his work, David spent very little time with his family. Being a long-distance truck driver, he was away from home for 20, 25 days a month. In fact, all the worries about the children and the household fell on Veronica's shoulders. The young woman, left alone with everyday problems, often complained to her loved ones about the difficulties that had befallen her. Thus, against the background of forced loneliness and the absence of her husband, rumors spread around Santa Croce that Veronica had a lover. However, when checking this information, the investigators were unable to find any evidence of infidelity. When they came to the Stivel couple's house, the police found Veronica in a terrible state. According to David, the tragic death of their son had completely broken his wife. The young woman constantly cried, refused to eat and communicate with others. As a result of severe stress and exhaustion, Veronica was admitted to the hospital, where doctors had to put her on a drip with a nutrient solution to save her from complete extinction. Even the police officers who had seen a lot were shocked by the state of the grief-stricken mother. Veronica's face was haggard, deep shadows lay under her eyes, and her skin had acquired an unhealthy, earthy hue. It seemed that along with her son, she had buried a part of herself. During this difficult period, the couple decided to send the younger child to the grandparents because Veronica could not fully take care of his needs. David, who supported his wife with all his heart, was forced to quit his job in order to be constantly by her side. The investigators saw how hard the loss of a child had hit the Stivel family, but despite their suffering, the police were obliged to continue the investigation. Therefore, it was decided to take the grief-stricken parents to the place where their son's body was found. Perhaps this trip would help shed light on the circumstances of the brutal crime and bring the investigation closer to unraveling the identity of the killer. The Guardians of Order, striving to extract as much useful information as possible, decided to videotape the trip of the Stivel couple. They hoped that visiting the scene of the tragedy would help shed light on the circumstances of the boy's death. However, the footage that captured Veronica shocked the police. Instead of a grief-stricken mother, there was only a pale shadow on the screen, barely resembling a living person.
It seemed that along with her son, Veronica had buried a part of herself. The list of suspects also included the elderly hunter, who accidentally discovered Loris's body just four hours after the boy was reported missing. Such a timely find raised legitimate questions from the investigators. Of course, it could have been a simple coincidence, but the police were obliged to check all possible leads and make sure that the hunter was not involved in the crime. The Guardians of Order began a large-scale check, trying to find at least some connection between the man and the deceased child. But all their efforts were in vain. The hunter easily passed a polygraph test, and his alibi on the morning of Loris's disappearance was confirmed. Moreover, no fingerprints or DNA traces of the elderly man were found on the boy's body. However, the tragedy stirred up the quiet town, and the local residents, gripped by suspicion, began to accuse Veronica of an intimate relationship, not only with the hunter's grandson, but also with the man himself. In the end, after a thorough check, the detectives removed all charges from the elderly man, making sure that he only happened to be in the right place at the right time, and indeed accidentally stumbled upon the body of the unfortunate boy. The investigation was at a dead end. All assumptions and leads yielded no results, and there was still no evidence pointing to the identity of the perpetrator. In the hope of making a breakthrough in the investigation, Carabinieri, an elite unit of the Italian police, were summoned from Rome to Santa Croce. Having studied the case materials, the newly arrived investigators drew attention to Veronica's difficult relationship with her relatives and considered that the mother could be involved in the disappearance of her own son. Loris's grandmother and grandfather told the Carabinieri about a strange conversation with their grandson that took place shortly before his death. The boy told them that his mother had bought plastic ties for a school experiment. This happened literally the day before Loris went missing. The police were on alert. Ties are a rather dangerous item, the use of which is strictly prohibited in educational institutions. The detectives hastened to contact the teachers of the deceased boy and found out that no experiments requiring the use of cable ties were planned at the school. Initially, the investigators assumed that Loris had simply made up this story. But after receiving the report from the forensic experts, they looked at the situation from a different angle. According to the experts' conclusion, the child's death occurred approximately between 9 and 10 a.m. on the day of his disappearance. The cause of the boy's death was strangulation by a thin, foreign object tightly pulled around his neck. Comparing these data, the police came to the conclusion that the murder weapon could well have been the ill-fated cable ties. The investigators had a new version, probably, Loris really, for some reason, asked his mother to buy him ties and even came up with a story about their necessity for school classes. In that case, the boy should have been carrying them in his backpack on that fateful morning. But how could the killer have known about this? It is unlikely that the criminal accidentally attacked the child and then began to rummage through his backpack in search of a murder weapon. The Carabinieri were sure the key to the solution lies in the missing backpack of Loris. By finding it, the police would be able to track down the killer. All garbage landfills where waste from Santa Croce was transported were blocked. Several days were spent on a thorough examination of the landfills, but to no avail. The boy's school backpack seemed to have vanished into thin air. Meanwhile, forensic experts continued to examine the body of the deceased child. In addition to signs of strangulation, they discovered another strange detail. Despite the absence of underwear and lowered pants, no signs of sexual violence or DNA traces of the alleged pervert were found on Loris's body. This information made the police doubt their initial version. The investigators were still looking for the boy's killer, but they already understood that they were not dealing with a typical maniac or child molester at all. The sexual motive for the crime no longer seemed obvious. To advance the investigation, the investigators needed to compile a psychological portrait of the killer. But at this stage, there was a catastrophic lack of information. There was nowhere for evidence to come from because the real criminal had left no traces behind. The meager facts at the disposal of the Carabinieri simply did not add up to a complete picture. The death of Loris Stivel remained a mystery and the investigators were just beginning to understand how winding and thorny the road to the truth would be. Who is he? 
the ruthless killer of a little boy? Is he lurking among the residents of Santa Croce, or has he already left the town? The answers to these questions could only be provided by the painstaking work of the police, who had to dissect the life of the Stivel family bit by bit. After all, sometimes the solution to a crime lies in the most unexpected details that are invisible to the uninitiated eye. Trying to unravel the mystery of the death of little Loris, the detectives decided to carefully study the route that Veronica Stivel followed on the day of the terrible violence against her son. And although Santa Croce was a small provincial town, the central street along which the mother and child drove in their black sedan was equipped with many video surveillance cameras installed on houses and shops. Collecting and analyzing the footage from these cameras required a lot of time and effort. Law enforcement officers carefully viewed each frame, hoping to notice some third figure that could have been following Veronica and Loris on that fateful morning. Perhaps some suspicious car was following their vehicle, but no matter how hard the investigators tried, they could not find anything unusual on the recordings that could shed light on the circumstances of the crime. However, soon the detective's attention was drawn to some oddities in Veronica's own behavior. First of all, the video failed to find the moment when Loris enters the school building, although the mother continued to insist that she personally accompanied her son almost to the threshold of the educational institution. After viewing dozens of hours of footage, the police were convinced that on that morning, the woman with the children never made it to the school. Only the younger child of Veronica got out of the car near the kindergarten. Continuing to painstakingly study the surveillance camera recordings, the investigators noticed another suspicious detail. In the frames from the intersection that Veronica was supposed to pass on the way to school, it is clearly visible how the woman suddenly turns towards an old church, the very one near which Loris's body was later found. This seemed extremely strange to the police, because for many years Veronica had used a completely different road. What made her change her usual route on the very day her son was found dead? This question haunted the Carabinieri and only intensified their suspicions. At this stage of the investigation, the police decided not to reveal their guesses yet so as not to scare off Veronica. But in light of the new evidence, they seriously began to consider the young mother as the main suspect. To check the truthfulness of her testimony, experienced investigators suggested that the woman personally drive with them along the same route that she allegedly followed on the day her son died. Thanks to the surveillance camera footage, the police already thoroughly knew Veronica's path on that fateful morning and wanted to see how she would behave. Veronica agreed to this kind of reconstruction of events. But when the car with the suspect and the investigators drove up to the ill-fated intersection where the woman turned towards the church, she suddenly began to claim that she was moving along her usual route. Veronica's lie was so obvious that the police had no doubt about her involvement in the crime. With her deceitful behavior, Loris's mother only aggravated the suspicions and became the main participant in the case of the murder of her own son. The detectives decided to search the Stivel couple's house and bring Veronica to the station for questioning. Realizing that the police considered her a probable killer, the woman flew into a rage. She categorically denied her guilt, claiming that under no circumstances could she harm her child but the investigators were convinced of the opposite. The interrogation lasted several hours, during which Veronica stubbornly repeated her innocence. But under the pressure of irrefutable evidence, the woman still made several important confessions. She reported that that morning she had dropped Loris off about 500 meters from the school because she was in a great hurry. According to the mother, the boy was supposed to get to the place of study on his own, and someone could well attack him on the way. When asked what Veronica was doing near the church next to which her son's body was found, she replied that she was not at all familiar with that area and had never been there. But these words were immediately refuted. The suspect's sister confirmed that as children, she and Veronica often played near that very church and knew every corner of those places perfectly well. And the surveillance camera footage clearly indicated that on the day of Loris's death, his mother was passing by the ill-fated place. Trying to find new leads and confirm their suspicions, 
the detectives had to watch the many hours of video recordings again and again. The father of the deceased boy was also involved in the study of the evidence. At first, David refused to believe in his wife's involvement in the murder of their son. But when he saw with his own eyes on the surveillance camera footage how Veronica, instead of taking Loris to school, brings him back home, the first seeds of doubt settled in the unfortunate father's soul. The recordings clearly show how the mother and her two sons leave the house early in the morning. Then Veronica, together with the younger child, goes to the kindergarten, and Loris disappears. There is not a single frame with the boy on the video anymore. Only a vague silhouette, remotely resembling his figure, flashes near the house shortly before Veronica's return. The next oddity, contrary to her usual practice, Veronica did not park the car near the house, but drove backwards right into the garage. This happened at about 9 o'clock in the morning. The investigators had no doubt. It was during this time period that the unfortunate Loris was killed. A terrible guess that made the blood run cold. Could it be that Veronica, his own mother, had coolly dealt with a defenseless child? And then, as if nothing had happened, went about her business. Could there be such a monstrous darkness in the soul of this woman that she was able to raise her hand against her own son? These questions tormented not only the investigators, but also the unfortunate father, who simply could not believe in the guilt of his wife. David feverishly recalled the image of Veronica, a caring mother and loving wife. How is this even possible? What could have pushed her to take this terrible, unnatural step? Or maybe the police are mistaken and his wife became a victim of a monstrous set of circumstances. David's heart told him that Veronica could not have done such a thing. But the mind, looking at the irrefutable evidence of her lies, insisted on the opposite. Meanwhile, the police, as if obsessed, continued to look for new facts and evidence that would help shed light on the circumstances of the mysterious death of Loris. They were convinced that the key to solving the crime lay precisely in Veronica's actions and movements on the morning of that fateful day. The investigators checked and rechecked every detail, every minute, trying to find the slightest discrepancy in the suspect's testimony. The murder of a child by his own mother. Such a terrible assumption did not fit in the head, but the facts were inexorable. More and more evidence pointed to Veronica's involvement in the violence against eight-year-old Loris. It only remained to find irrefutable proof of her guilt and find out the true motives for this monstrous crime. After all, until the investigation answers the main question, why? The soul of little Loris will not be able to find peace and his killer will not be able to receive the deserved punishment. On that ill-fated day, Loris never showed up at school. Everything indicated that the boy stayed at home and when Veronica returned and drove into the garage, she was doing something hidden from prying eyes. Her car remained out of sight of the surveillance cameras, and this only increased the investigators' suspicions. It seemed that Veronica was deliberately hiding something, trying to confuse the investigation. When the police shared their conclusions with the main suspect, she continued to stubbornly deny her involvement in the death of her son. According to Veronica, on the morning of that day, she took Loris to school, then delivered the younger child to kindergarten, after which she returned home and engaged in her usual affairs. The mother stood her ground, insisting that the boy could have been kidnapped right near the educational institution, but the police did not believe a single word of hers. The surveillance camera recordings eloquently testify to the opposite. At 9.23 a.m., Veronica left the house again, and just two minutes later, her car was already moving in the direction of the old mill, the same one where the body of the unfortunate Loris was later found. The woman returned home at 9.38, and this time she was definitely alone. Given such a short period of time, the investigators concluded that at the moment when Veronica dumped her son's body into the ditch, the boy was already dead. But the oddities did not end there. Already at 9.41, Veronica, as if nothing had happened, went to the cooking classes that she regularly attended in the morning. The classes started at 10 o'clock, so the woman left in advance, so as not to be late and not arouse unnecessary suspicion. In the classroom, 
No one noticed anything unusual in her behavior. Veronica looked and behaved as usual, as if these terrible events had never happened. The GPS data obtained from the suspect's phone and car fully confirmed the route of her movements, reconstructed by the investigators. It would seem that the picture of the crime is clear, and all the evidence points to Veronica's guilt. But alas, the police did not yet have formal evidence sufficient to bring charges. Not a single surveillance camera recording captured the very moment of the mother's violence against her own son. Therefore, the investigators continued to meticulously collect information, and Veronica was temporarily placed under arrest. The case was coming to a denouement, but suddenly, a female police officer who was on duty that day near the school turned to the police. She claimed that she had seen with her own eyes how Veronica had dropped Loris off from the car right in front of the educational institution. This statement was at odds with the main version of the investigation. However, the police were in no hurry to blindly trust the words of their colleague. After all, her testimony directly contradicted the surveillance camera footage. The route that Veronica followed day after day was traced literally by the minute. Most likely, the female police officer simply confused the dates because the suspect brought her son to school every day, and from the outside her actions always looked the same. Meanwhile, Veronica, who was in custody, continued to shout about her innocence at the top of her voice. But the first seeds of doubt had already taken root in people's hearts. Faith in the woman's non-involvement in the crime was especially shaken when the investigators told her husband David about his wife's obvious lie regarding the route she allegedly took Loris to school on the day of his disappearance. This news made the man doubt Veronica's honesty and side with the investigation. Feeling that the suspect might still trust her husband, the police decided to arrange a personal meeting for them in the hope that David would be able to get a confession or at least some new facts from his wife. After all, Veronica was the only person who had a complete picture of the events of that fateful morning, and the investigators were not going to miss this chance. David agreed to talk to his wife face to face without wiretapping. He admitted that the idea was good, but emphasized that his goal was not to achieve his wife's conviction, but only to find out the truth about what happened. On January 6th, 2015, a month after the violence against Loris, a meeting between David and Veronica took place in prison. According to the laws of the country, the man had no right to be there, but for the sake of the opportunity to get closer to unraveling the terrible crime, the police made an exception for him. The first thing Veronica did, without even greeting her husband, was ask if he had a wiretap microphone on him. David assured that he had no recording devices on him and demonstrated the absence of bugs to confirm his words. He did not lie. Microphones were really unnecessary because the whole meeting was still being recorded by a surveillance camera installed in the prison room. During the conversation, Veronica stubbornly stood her ground, repeating the same version of events over and over again. She kept saying that she had taken Loris to school and had no idea what had happened to the boy next. The woman repeated these words like a mantra to everyone. The police, lawyers, her husband, relatives who visited her behind bars. She seemed to have taken on the role of an innocent victim who was unjustly accused of a monstrous crime. Nevertheless, despite all the efforts of the investigators, it was not yet possible to prove Veronica's involvement in the violence against her son. Even the motive for the murder remained a mystery. After all, Everyone who knew the suspect unanimously claimed that she was a wonderful mother who sincerely loved her children. Of course, sometimes there were unkind rumors that abound in any city that is even slightly notable, but the police carefully checked every rumor and found no confirmation of them. The official version of the investigation, according to which the mother brutally dealt with her own child, seemed so monstrous and unnatural that even the seasoned guardians of order refused to believe it. But the facts stubbornly added up to a single picture and only the last piece was missing in this mosaic, irrefutable evidence that would finally expose Veronica and force her to confess to what she had done. The investigators continued to methodically collect information, interview witnesses, and analyze surveillance camera recordings. 
they were firmly determined to see the case through to the end and find the killer of little Loris, whoever he turned out to be. After all, while the criminal is at large, no family in Santa Croce can feel safe, and the shadow of the terrible tragedy will long hover over the quiet Italian town, reminding that sometimes evil lurks behind the most respectable mask. Apparently, Veronica's sincere love and care for her children was indeed beyond doubt. Rumors about her unworthy behavior as a mother were not confirmed. The only argument in favor of the version about the woman's involvement in the death of her son remained her extremely depressed emotional state, aggravated by imprisonment. Depression and unstable psyche seemed to the investigators to be the only plausible motive for such a terrible crime. However, the investigation has again reached an impasse. Then the detectives decided on an unexpected move, to allow the grief-stricken mother to say goodbye to her deceased child right at his grave. Accompanied by a whole motorcade of police cars with flashing lights on, Veronica was taken to the cemetery. From the outside, it might seem as if a notorious maniac was being transported through the city under escort. Of course, the officers prudently installed a listening device on the tombstone. They were sure, left alone with the resting place of her son, the grief-stricken mother would not stand it and give herself away, either confess to what she had done or ask the boy for forgiveness for her monstrous act. What was the surprise of the Guardians of Order when Veronica spoke something completely different from what they expected to hear? Crying over the child's grave, the woman begged the heavens for justice. She swore that she would find the real culprit of Loris's death and punish him with her own hands. For the police officers lurking in ambush, these words came as a complete surprise. They could only escort Veronica back to her cell in bewilderment. But on the way to prison, something strange happened. The young mother suddenly declared that she had experienced some kind of insight at the cemetery. Allegedly, fragmentary memories of that fateful day, previously eluding her memory, began to return to her. However, Veronica refused to share them with the police, demanding instead a new meeting with her husband. On November 6, 2015, David again crossed the threshold of the prison cell where his wife was being held. Like all meetings of prisoners, this meeting was thoroughly documented. But this time, the suspect behaved differently. For the first time since the beginning of the investigation, Veronica admitted that she had lied about the events of the day Loris disappeared. Now she claimed that on that ill-fated morning, she had not taken her son to school at all. Falteringly and confusedly, the woman tried to describe a certain unusual state in which she was during those hours. According to her, reality seemed to slip away, plunging consciousness into a thick fog. Only vague, fragmentary images appeared before the mind's eye. Veronica remembered taking the younger child to kindergarten and then returning home, where Loris should have stayed. The older son did not want to go to classes that day, so the mother allowed him to stay. Further, there was a gap in Veronica's memories. She seemed to have dropped out of reality for several hours, and when she came to her senses, Loris was no longer in the house. Deciding that she still took the boy to school, the woman went about her daily business. And only when she appeared at the doors of the educational institution after lunch and did not find her son there, she realized her terrible mistake. Having listened to his wife's faltering story, the investigators were in no hurry to believe the details that had suddenly surfaced in her memory. They say it's just a trick designed to mitigate guilt and get the court's leniency. Like, a repentant mother who became a victim of her own clouding of mind deserves less punishment than a cold-blooded child killer. However, there were those who admitted Veronica's state of mind could indeed have pushed her to take a terrible step. Alas, the suspect's younger child was too small to give the police testimony about whether he had seen his older brother on the day of his disappearance. This fact only added mystery to the case. And although the investigators were still convinced of the mother's involvement in her son's death, they decided to play along with her. Veronica was offered to return to the empty house, allegedly in order to awaken new memories in her subconscious. The police led the woman through the rooms that had kept an ominous silence since that very day. But as soon as she crossed the threshold of the nursery where little Loris always frolicked, 
the suspect put on a whole performance. In a lifeless, emotionless voice, she began to speak on behalf of her deceased son, reproducing an imaginary dialogue with him. At that moment, the investigators finally became convinced. Before them was an unscrupulous liar and manipulator, skillfully playing on pity in order to lead the servants of the law along a false trail. But how, being of sound mind, did Veronica manage to deceive everyone around her for so long and virtuously? During the investigation, she communicated with dozens of specialists, psychologists, criminologists, experts, and not one of them doubted her sincerity. The suspect's defender insisted, she really suffers from some kind of mental ailments that deprive the woman of the ability to adequately perceive reality. As a result, Veronica presented to the police and the public yet another version of what happened. And although the guardians of order treated her stories with healthy skepticism, this story found many supporters. According to the mother, having returned from the kindergarten, she began her usual chores, started washing bottles for the baby. That morning, Loris flatly refused to go to school, and the woman did not insist. The child calmly played in his room while Veronica was busy around the house. Nothing boded trouble. But when, after some time, the mother entered the nursery, a terrible picture appeared before her eyes. Loris was lying on the floor without signs of life, and plastic ties were pulled around his neck. Apparently, the boy was playing with a dangerous find, and at some point tightened the noose around his own throat. The ties, connected to each other like a chain, mercilessly cut into the tender skin, not allowing a single breath. Caught off guard by the terrible sight, Veronica, according to her, succumbed to panic. With trembling hands, she tried to dial the emergency service number, but her fingers refused to hit the right buttons, either from excitement or from the approaching madness. And when she finally pulled herself together and ran to her son, he was no longer showing signs of life. No matter how hard the mother, maddened with grief, tried, she could not tear the ties with her bare hands. They only dug deeper into Loris's throat, finally depriving him of his last hope of salvation. The terrible truth struck Veronica like a bolt of lightning. She realized that what had happened would certainly be blamed on her. In the eyes of others, the grief-stricken woman would instantly turn into a cold-blooded child killer, and then, gripped by animal horror, in a semi-insane state, Veronica decided on the unthinkable, to get rid of the body of her own child. Later, forensic experts will indeed find characteristic scratches on the neck and face of the deceased. Obviously, trying to tear off the suffocating noose, the boy dug his nails into his own skin, but the plastic bonds cut too deeply into the flesh, not allowing them to be released. The investigators even admitted the possibility that the mother, maddened with fear, could have yanked the ties in desperation, only aggravating the situation and unwittingly accelerating Loris's death from asphyxiation. This heartbreaking story told by Veronica became another twist in the tangled case. In part, it shed light on the mysterious circumstances of the child's death, but at the same time, it raised even more questions. Why didn't the boy call his mother for help when playing with the ties began to pose a real threat to life? What made the woman go for concealing the corpse instead of going to the police? And most importantly, could this monstrous tragedy be not an accident but a cold-blooded crime? The investigation had yet to find answers to these questions. In the meantime, the residents of Santa Croce, shocked to the depths of their souls by what had happened, were tormented by painful doubts. They did not want to believe that a mother was capable of taking the life of her own child with such ease. But it was also impossible to write off what happened as a mere accident. There were too many strange, inexplicable details that distinguished this frightening story. And the public waited with bated breath for the finale of the investigation, which would shed light on the mystery of the death of little Loris. Whatever the outcome of the case, the residents of the town were sure of one thing. Their peaceful provincial life would never be the same again. According to Veronica's new version, her son Loris became a victim of a fatal accident. As the mother claimed, on that ill-fated morning, the boy pulled the plastic ties found at home around his own neck. With fear in his eyes, 
The child tried to free himself by pulling on the end of the improvised noose, but instead, the loop only dug deeper into the tender skin, mercilessly cutting off the access of oxygen. Veronica assured that, having discovered her son in such a distressed state, she rushed to help. Realizing that it would not be possible to break the strong ties with bare hands, the woman dashed to the kitchen for scissors. Alas, when she returned to the nursery and cut the plastic noose, Loris was no longer showing signs of life. The boy had lost consciousness and was not breathing. According to the mother, the terrible find plunged her into a state of acute panic. With trembling hands, Veronica tried to dial the emergency service number, but her fingers refused to hit the buttons and the numbers swam before her eyes. The horror of what had happened literally paralyzed the unfortunate woman, and at that fateful moment, it was as if a switch clicked in Veronica's head. She suddenly realized with frightening clarity she would certainly be blamed for her son's death, a negligent mother who did not look after her child. In the eyes of others, she would instantly turn from a victim of tragic circumstances into a cold-blooded child killer. Gripped by animal fear, being in a completely insane state, Veronica decided on the unthinkable, to get rid of the body of her own child. Later, the results of the forensic medical examination indirectly confirmed the mother's words. Characteristic scratches were indeed found on the face and neck of the deceased Loris, apparently traces of the boy's desperate attempts to tear off the suffocating ties. Alas, the plastic noose cut too deeply into the skin not allowing it to be released. The investigators even admitted the possibility that the mother, maddened with fear, could have yanked the ties in a panic herself, only aggravating the situation and unwittingly accelerating her son's death from asphyxia. To shed light on the blank spots in the suspect's testimony, the police decided to deliver her together with her husband David again to the place where Loris's body was found. Here, the grief-stricken mother finally admitted she really threw the lifeless child into the ditch with her own hands. But at the same time, Veronica stubbornly denied her involvement in the boy's death. The woman answered all the investigators' questions in a confused and reluctant manner. She was unable to clearly explain why Loris's underwear was missing from the corpse. This detail did not fit into the version of the accident voiced by her in any way. The very fact of what happened also raised considerable doubts. For what reason would an eight-year-old child, even out of pure curiosity, tighten a deadly noose around his own neck? Why didn't Loris call his mother when the situation began to get out of control? Veronica had no answers to these questions. Later, the suspect seemed to remember another important detail. According to her, Loris's corpse was badly damaged when it fell into the ditch. Allegedly, the ravine turned out to be too deep, which is why the boy's body, rolling head over heels down the slope, was covered with numerous abrasions and took on an unnaturally twisted pose. But even these explanations did not convince the investigation of Veronica's innocence. At the trial, the prosecution tried to refute her confessions, referring to the woman's uncharacteristic behavior, which most alarmed the guardians of order. First of all, the prosecution pointed to a strange maneuver that Veronica made for some reason on that ill-fated morning. Having parked the car in the garage, the woman turned the car in such a way that it would be convenient to inconspicuously load a large bundle into it. For example, a body wrapped in cloth. And this was done at a time when the mother could not yet know about Loris's death, who, according to her own admission, allegedly died later. In the prosecutor's opinion, such actions clearly indicated the premeditated nature of the murder. However, Veronica's lawyers continued to insist on the innocence of their client. They claimed that the mother did not kill the child. The boy became a victim of a tragic accident, independently taking his own life through negligence. Gripped by shock and horror, realizing the full gravity of what happened, Veronica simply got confused and did stupid things. The fear of the inevitable accusation of her son's death pushed her to a desperate step, concealing the body. But this does not at all mean that the unfortunate woman deliberately harmed Loris. There remained, however, one key question that the defense could not give a convincing answer to. If the boy's death was really accidental, 
Why did Veronica need to take off his underwear and then put his pants back on? The defendant herself got off with vague excuses on this score, referring to memory lapses. But the prosecution had its own very plausible explanation. The prosecutor insisted, having removed the underpants from her murdered son, Veronica deliberately tried to stage an attack by a sexual maniac. The calculation was cynical but correct. The police would certainly follow a false trail, focusing on the search for a rapist pedophile. And at first, this trick worked. The investigators really began by working out the version of the involvement of a sexual sadist operating in the vicinity in the crime. And only later, having sorted out the details, the Guardians of Order realized, before them, was nothing more than a competent staging. At one of the court hearings on the case of the murder of Laura Stivel, sensational information was heard that shocked the audience. Desperate to prove her innocence, Veronica suddenly gave a new, completely unexpected version of what happened. According to the defendant, the boy's death was caused by his own grandfather on the paternal side, Andrea Stivel. As Veronica told the court, she was connected with her husband's father by far from family ties. Allegedly, for a long time, the father-in-law had a secret, intimate relationship with his daughter-in-law. And it so happened that it was on the day of the murder that little Loris caught the lovers during another date. The boy began to threaten that he would immediately tell his father about everything. And then Andrea, gripped by anger and fear of exposure, attacked his grandson and strangled him. Despite the absurdity of such a statement, the investigators were obliged to check Veronica's words. Once again, they began to scrupulously study the recordings from the surveillance cameras. And they came to the conclusion that on the morning of the day of the murder, not a single outsider man entered the house of the Stivel couple. However, the police were much more interested in another fact. Watching the video in which Veronica leaves the house around 9.30 in the morning, the Guardians of Order drew attention to a suspicious detail. In the back seat of the woman's car, the silhouette of a certain passenger seemed to be visible. To check this lead, law enforcement officers involved experts specializing in the analysis of video materials. Alas, the professionals did not confirm the investigators' guess. In their opinion, the strange shadow on the seat was just an optical illusion, the result of the play of light and glare on the windows of the car. Andrea Stivel himself, who was informed of his daughter-in-law's testimony, sharply refuted her accusations. The man stated that he had never had an affair with his son's wife and was even less involved in the murder of his own grandson. According to the elderly man, Veronica once again tried to defame his name and lead the investigation along a false path, composing a completely fantastic version. Other facts also spoke in favor of Andrea's non-involvement in the crime. At the time of Loris's death, his grandfather had an iron alibi, confirmed by witness testimony. In addition, when checking Veronica's telephone calls and emails and her father-in-law, it was not possible to find a single confirmation of the love affair that the defendant was talking about. In the end, the investigation completely removed suspicion of the murder of his grandson from Andrea Stivel. None of the representatives of the law believed the new, shocking version voiced by Veronica. The trial was coming to an end, but until the last day of the hearings, it was not possible to achieve an unambiguous understanding of what actually happened on that fateful November day in 2014. The prosecution insisted on Veronica's guilt, pointing to numerous inconsistencies in her testimony and behavior uncharacteristic of a grief-stricken mother. The defense stubbornly adhered to the version of Loris's death as a result of an accident, According to the lawyers, it was panic and fear at that moment that pushed Veronica to a stupid and reckless act, concealing the body of her own child. The court and the jury faced an extremely difficult task to determine who Veronica Stivel really was, a cold-blooded child killer who decided on an unthinkable crime, or a victim of a tragic set of circumstances who could not cope with the horror that came over her and made irreparable mistakes. But whatever verdict Themis passed, one thing was clear. The life of little Loris, untimely and cruelly cut short, would never return.
and the pain and suffering of his loved ones could not be cured by years or even the most severe sentence for the guilty. Veronica Stival's behavior throughout the investigation and trial suggested that the investigation was dealing with a person suffering from serious mental disorders. This was unanimously claimed by both law enforcement officers and experts involved in the case. What is the inadequate reaction of the suspect during one of the interrogations when she suddenly began to sing for no reason? And how many times did the officers observe how her speech from calm and intelligible abruptly changed to incoherent muttering to herself and her gaze froze and became empty, as if glassy. It seemed that Veronica periodically lost touch with reality, immersing herself in some kind of her own parallel world. Often she was caught imitating smoking a cigarette, which in fact was not in her hands, as if the woman had gone so deep into herself that the surrounding reality ceased to exist for her. Veronica's own mother also told the court about her daughter's mental problems. As it turned out, mental disorders had haunted the defendant almost from infancy. As a child, she became a victim of sexual violence by older boys. The trauma experienced at such a tender age could not but affect the girl's further development. Already at the age of 14, Veronica first tried to settle scores with life by swallowing bleach after a quarrel with classmates. And a year later, she made a second suicidal attempt, this time deciding to hang herself in a greenhouse. Later, Veronica even had to undergo a course of treatment in a psychiatric clinic. The investigators were most shocked by the story of how once a girl in hysterics called her mother and begged to take her home, assuring that her brother had raped her. Alas, the accusations of incest never found any confirmation, and no one simply believed the words of the insane patient. But despite all this eloquent evidence of Veronica's mental instability, the official examination came to an unexpected conclusion. According to experts, at the time of the murder of her son, the woman acted surprisingly cold-bloodedly, prudently, and cruelly. She had no serious deviations that would allow her to be recognized as insane and relieve her of responsibility for what she had done. The trial of Veronica Stivel dragged on for a long four years, an unprecedented period for such cases. Numerous postponements of meetings, conflicting testimonies of witnesses, suddenly opening new circumstances requiring additional investigative actions, all this time after time, delayed the moment of justice. But in the end, the jury rendered its verdict. The defendant was found guilty of premeditated murder of her own child and concealing his body in order to avoid responsibility. The judge announced the sentence, 30 years in prison. It would seem that such a severe punishment should, if not soften, then at least reconcile the grief-stricken relatives with the loss. But Veronica did not even think to calm down. Barely realizing that the verdict was not in her favor, the woman jumped up from her seat and began to shout at the unfortunate Andrea Stivel, the grandfather of the deceased Loris, all those absurd and dirty accusations that sounded from her lips during the court hearings. The confused bailiffs, had to forcibly remove the defendant from the courtroom. Straight in handcuffs, Veronica was escorted to a prison cell where she would have to spend the next three decades. To this day, the sword of Damocles of Justice hangs over the head of Veronica Stivel. The truth about what actually happened to eight-year-old Loris will probably remain buried in the dungeons of her consciousness. No one knows if this terrible secret will ever come out but most of the investigators who have devoted more than one year to the investigation of the tangled case are inclined to the same version. In their opinion, the boy's death was not an accident as the mother tried to present. Most likely, on that ill-fated day, Loris refused to go to school for some reason. Perhaps this had happened before. Because of absenteeism, a quarrel broke out between mother and son, and in a fit of uncontrolled anger, Veronica strangled the child with the ill-fated ties. And then, realizing what she had done and fearing the inevitable punishment, she got rid of the body and began to lie right and left, trying to cover her tracks. However, the discovery of cable ties purchased by a woman on the eve of the tragedy leads to even more ominous reflections. Was the murder of Loris a pre-planned, cold-bloodedly conceived and prepared crime? 
Perhaps the mother had long held a grudge against her unwanted offspring and was only waiting for a suitable moment to implement her monstrous plan. Alas, the true motives and circumstances of this terrible massacre are most likely never to become public knowledge. The life of David Stivel, the father of the deceased boy, seemed to fall apart into small fragments after the verdict was passed on his wife. Overnight, the man lost his beloved son, adored wife, and even his job. Throughout all these years, David never gained firm confidence that it was Veronica who had massacred Loris. The father had never noticed in his wife, who always seemed to him a caring and loving mother, the slightest tendency to violence against children. He simply could not understand what could have pushed her to such a monstrous step. Today, David Stival is trying to live for the sake of his younger son, the only thing he has left from his family. Elderly parents help him in the difficult task of raising the boy. The father draws strength to move on, in the hope that someday, the truth about what happened to his older child will still come out. And then, the executioners of little Loris, whoever they turn out to be, will certainly answer for their atrocity to the fullest extent of the law. An ominous call awakened the quiet Argentine town of Gualaguaychki on an early December morning in 2017. A passerby reported finding a young man bleeding with two gunshot wounds. This is how the investigation into a gruesome murder began, which would soon expose the darkest secrets of one of the seemingly well-off families. The victim of the crime was 20-year-old Fernando Pastorizzo, a cheerful and good-natured young man who loved animals and had no serious problems. However, his girlfriend Nahir Galarza, born on September 11, 1998, was linked to many frightening details. In childhood, Nahir is described as a joyful and charming girl. At school, she demonstrated outstanding results, especially in learning foreign languages. The girl's younger brother lagged behind in development and was later declared disabled. But the Galarza family maintained harmony and order. The mother taught the children to be tidy from an early age. Over time, Nahir developed a truly maniacal obsession with cleanliness. She regularly did thorough cleanings, paying close attention to hand hygiene. The father, a police officer, adored his children and together with his wife, spoiled them with love. It was easy for Nahir to fulfill her dream. After school, she entered the law faculty of the university without any problems. The sophisticated student led an active lifestyle, went to the gym, got massages, and often attended parties with numerous friends. Nahir met her fateful lover Fernando in her teenage years in 2012, when she was 14 and he was 15. But their relationship did not work out from the very beginning. There were endless quarrels due to mutual suspicions and jealousy. They would break up for a while, then get back together. Even a family trip to Brazil in 2016 for a joint vacation only temporarily reconciled the lovers conflict soon flared up with renewed vigor. On the eve of Christmas 2017, Nahir and Fernando, after a quarrel, decided to go together to a party with mutual friends. There was a scuffle involving Fernando, the reasons for which remained unclear. After returning from her regular massage on December 28th, Nahir found her phone discharged and went to Fernando's to get the charger she had left there. That fateful night, he drove the girl home. But the next morning, a taxi driver passing by stumbled upon Fernando's lifeless, bloody body with two gunshot wounds lying near his motorcycle and a pair of helmets. Thus, the chilling details of the terrible crime that took place against the backdrop of an ordinary family drama surfaced. The investigation into this case was just beginning, but it was already becoming clear. The true causes of the tragedy were much deeper than the banal quarrels of the lovers. Ahead was the task of uncovering the dark secrets that the Galarza family had kept for many years. As soon as it dawned after the fateful night, Nahir posted a touching post on her Instagram with their joint photo. Five years together, quarrels, breakups, reconciliations, but always with love. I love you forever, my angel Fernando. Soon, the girl was called by the agitated mother of the murdered young man with questions about what had happened but Nahir replied that she knew nothing. Meanwhile, 
the investigators who arrived at the crime scene in the quiet, respectable neighborhood began to carefully collect all possible clues and leads. The slightest detail could be important. The initial obvious version, a robbery, was immediately dismissed as all valuables remained untouched with the murdered young man. The law enforcement officers were puzzled. A neighborhood with minimal crime, so who and why could have so brutally dealt with Fernando? According to the examination, the murder was committed with a 9mm pistol, which is usually used by police officers. Suspicion arose that the shooter could be a law enforcement officer. It also turned out that the first shot was fired at point-blank range from behind the victim. Apparently, Fernando was giving someone a ride on his motorcycle, and the criminal took advantage of the opportune moment to attack from an ambush. The second fatal shot, however, was a finishing one straight to the young man's heart. The discovery of two helmets near the body indicated that the victim apparently knew his killer well. When studying the CCTV footage, the investigation was surprised to find a girl calmly and serenely walking away from the crime scene. However, due to the low quality of the recording, it was impossible to see her face. Nevertheless, the main suspect was identified, Nahir Galarza, who was promptly summoned for questioning at the police station. During the interrogation, the girl, wringing her hands and wiping away tears, said that after meeting with Fernando on that fateful night, he drove her home, she took a shower and went to bed. And in the morning, learning of the tragedy, she posted that morning post, overwhelmed by deep grief and pain of loss. Nahir's sincerity of emotions did not arouse any suspicions of her involvement from the investigators. However, the questioning of the girl's father, who also turned out to be a police officer, seemed extremely suspicious. The man flatly refused to admit that he knew the murdered Fernando, but later, photographs surfaced in which the families of Nahir and the young man were captured together during one of their joint trips. Why did the father lie to the investigation? This raised suspicions about his possible involvement in the murder out of jealousy and dislike for his daughter's chosen one. And indeed, the ballistic examination showed that the fatal shots were fired from Nahir's father's personal service pistol. The alleged motive for the crime emerged, the father's dissatisfaction with his daughter's relationship with Fernando, their constant quarrels and breakups. But then Nahir unexpectedly intervened in the case, deciding to take the blame on herself and thereby cover for her parent. The girl firmly told the investigators that she had become a victim of domestic violence from her boyfriend, who allegedly abused her that night, which forced her to open fire on him in self-defense. However, this version caused distrust among the investigators and raised many new questions. Where could Nahir have gotten a gun? And why didn't she call the police and ambulance after the incident? It turned out that the girl simply stole her father's service weapon shortly before the tragedy, and after the deed, she quietly returned it to its original storage place. But her parents didn't even notice the gun's disappearance, which explains their non-involvement in what happened. The police also found CCTV footage showing Nahir calmly and serenely leaving the scene of her boyfriend's murder. During a new interrogation, the girl admitted to the investigation that she simply panicked and didn't think the shots would be fatal for Fernando. During the initial interrogations, Nahir justified herself by saying that she really didn't think it would end so tragically. When she realized that Fernando was dead, she was upset and depressed by what had happened. Testimonies from mutual friends of the couple were highly contradictory. Nahir's girlfriends unanimously blamed Fernando for everything, citing frequent complaints from the girl about her lover's poor treatment of her. On the other hand, friends of the murdered young man openly blamed the hot-tempered and aggressive Nahir for the tragedy. Some of them even claimed that the relationship between this couple could hardly be called normal and healthy. It was also revealed that both Fernando and Nahir had other casual affairs besides each other. A careful analysis of Fernando's chats with friends showed that the young man was indeed subjected to brutal violence from his jealous girlfriend, who constantly threatened him with retaliation. Fernando often complained to his friends about Nahir frequently beating him. In the end, the young man became completely disillusioned with these painful relationships and simply dreamed of a quiet, 
measured life away from his aggressive lover, which is why he broke up with her. It is possible that Nahir's murder of Fernando was an act of cruel revenge by a girl driven insane by jealousy. Later in her defense, Nahir insisted that everything had happened by accident. Allegedly, they fell off the motorcycle, after which the girl picked up the gun, resulting in two accidental shots. But the ballistics expert refuted this version. Two consecutive accidental shots from a gun could not have sounded. If the first one could still be tried to pass off as accidental, the second was clearly intentional. In addition, the CCTV footage clearly captured the girl walking away at a completely calm, measured pace, showing no sign of the shock she would later tell the investigators about. Although Nahir claimed that after the incident, she was in a heart-rending state of shock. The handwriting analysis conducted showed that the girl is prone to unstable emotional behavior, is highly self-centered, and has a pathological tendency to manipulate those around her. Other frightening traits of her personality were also revealed. Aggression, a thirst for attention at any cost, impulsiveness, a tendency for occasional lying and dominating other people. An analysis of Nahir's signature only confirmed the diagnosis, an unstable emotional state that she could not cope with. It turned out that the girl is not as simple as she might seem at first glance. At the age of 16, she once staged her own kidnapping, just for fun, shocking her parents. After the incident, her shocked parents sent their daughter for a full psychiatric evaluation. Doctors diagnosed Nahir with narcissistic personality disorder, with all the ensuing manifestations, as well as obsessive compulsive disorder in the form of a pathological obsession with cleanliness. During the trial, Nahir made no attempt to hide the peculiarities of her provocative behavior and explosive temper. She answered questions defiantly and arrogantly, came to court in inappropriate attire, and constantly flirted with those present. The girl continued to insist on the version of self-defense and an accidental incident, but no one believed her anymore, given the evidence collected by the investigators. At first, the father tried to defend Nahir, but in the end, he too renounced his own daughter. It was not possible to prove the girl's story of years of systematic violence from Fernando. Ultimately, the investigation reconstructed what happened roughly as follows. Around 2 a.m., after a prolonged heated argument, Fernando drove Nahir home. The young man asked for a final breakup, but the girl was categorically against it. Left alone, Nahir secretly stole her police officer father's service pistol. Then they went somewhere on Fernando's motorcycle. Along the way, the girl asked him to stop on a quiet, dark street. And in this ominous silence, deceiving the victim's vigilance, Nahir shot Fernando twice. First in the back, and when he fell to the ground, a finishing shot straight to the heart. After the deed, the girl calmly went home, took a shower, got rid of the traces of the crime, returned her father's gun to its place, and went to bed as if nothing had happened. At the trial, the prosecution loudly read out this chilling version of what happened, and Nahir, found guilty of murder, was sentenced to life imprisonment, a terrifying verdict for such a young person. She became the youngest girl in the country to receive such a severe punishment of this kind. However, she has a theoretical chance of being released on parole after 35 years of imprisonment, that is, at the age of 54. The sentence remained in force after three consecutive appeals filed by the convicted woman's lawyers. Four years later, Nahir again tried to disprove her guilt, shifting the responsibility for Fernando's murder onto her father. However, this version only raised new questions for the investigation. Why then is it Nahir and not her father seen on the recordings? Why would he kill his own potential son-in-law and ruin his daughter's life? Moreover, at the trial, Nahir's mother unexpectedly sided with her daughter and even divorced her husband, accusing him of abusing the family. In conclusion, Nahir stated that she had always been afraid of her despotic father, and that's why she initially decided to take the blame on herself. She even filed a lawsuit against her parent, claiming that he posed a danger to her mother and disabled younger brother. This high-profile case became widely discussed by the media and the public. Opinions were divided, 
Some supported Nahir and believed in her innocence, while others were convinced that she had ruined her youth and future because of unrestrained emotions and jealousy. In any case, the story of this insane beauty serves as a frightening reminder of the tragedies that human passions can lead to when they break free from the control of reason.